welcome back to the next session of uh, rheumatology i think we have completed the treatment of systemic lupus erythematosus now we are moving on to the other aspects of sle and other conjunctival disorders i think uh, hopefully we completed the ctd for today nevertheless uh, two other things which you have not yet uh, dealt with is dial that is drug induced lupus erythematosus number 1 and uh, dial is a completely different entity don't confuse this with uh, sle because once you stop the drug this this is completely reversible that's why uh, this is something different so don't confuse the systemic lupus erythematosus drug induced lupus erythematosus is completely different and um, you have some group of drugs which can produce drug induced lupus erythematosus usually there are a lot of mnemonics that uh, are circulating in the market but i used to remember during my mle days in my pre final and final i used to uh, mug this up with a mnemonic called mdt ship that's what the mnemonic i use uh, i felt like this is much useful for me so as m is concerned the most important cyclin so that's very commonly asked in mle exams and you have another m that is methyl dopa and we have d that stands for d penicillin and uh, t stands for terbinafen very important drug as well and a stands for a lot of sulfur drugs here and uh, apart from that we have hydrolyzin here that can produce and uh, we have i for inh isoniazid and at the same time there is another drug called infliximab ifx can produce uh, drug induced lupus erythematosus in general i can write any anti tnf alpha can result in development of drug induced lupus erythematosus and procainamid as well which can produce drug induced lupus lupus erythematosus apart from that if you want to know one more drug is also there that is pq along with it if you want to remember that is quinidine also can result in development of drug induced lupus erythematosus i can you can remember quinidine separately or you can remember uh, along with procainamide also because procainamide and quinidine both belongs to the same class 1a antiarrhythmic isn't it so you can remember like that also class 1a antiarrhythmics in that perspective so mdt ship so this is a mnemonic i generally used to Uh, no when i was a undergraduate student so in that uh, usually important you know like points will be used in bond drugs will be minocycline then terbinafen then infliximab that is anti tnf drugs procainamid and hydrolyzin so of course among all this if you want to know which of the drugs are going to have maximum risk of developing drug induced lupus erythematosus i'll be going for hydrolyzin and procainamid these are the two drugs that has the risk of developing drug induced lupus erythematosus among these two if you want to choose one i'll choose procainamide procainamide is the most important the last is the going to be the most important and has the maximum risk of developing drug induced lupus erythematosus and diagnosis uh, you know like is easy uh, the clinical picture will be that of sle but uh, more importantly ana may be positive and uh, and if you subtype the ana usually the anti histone antibodies will be positive here this is going to be the key feature for diagnosis and more importantly when you take this uh, drug induced lupus erythematosus you will not get any features usually they will be presenting with arthralgia probably with a little bit of serositis possible maybe with a little bit of skin rash for example that mala rash can happen even though it is not uh, very common still it can happen skin rash arthralgia serositis this is how they present and if you examine these patients they will be having ana positivity and anti histone antibody positivity but more than that what they will be asking you is uh, what are the things that will not happen in drug induced lupus erythematosus usually the lupus nephritis which means i can tell the kidney involvement that we typically see with anti ds dna will not be there in the setting of dial and vascular disease is not a feature of dial at the same time neurological lupus is also not a feature of dial these are three things that does not happen that's a usual question in exam so what are things that is not possible in setting of dial they can produce a little bit of mala rash even though it's quite rare at the same time they can develop arthralgia and serositis which are much much more common compared to other manifestations so if you do ana it will be positive and these two antibodies will be positive but they don't have any major organ involvement if at all somebody asks like what is the gold standard for diagnosis of drug induced lupus erythematosus you really uh, don't have any gold standard in the sense like if you discontinue the offending drug there will be complete reversal which means the patient will be completely normal and this is supposed to be the gold standard for diagnosis which means the stoppage of the offending drug will completely result in reversal of symptoms which means just because the patient is getting some drugs you cannot rule out an sle 
So that is the reason why once you discontinue the offending drug, if there is a complete reversal of all the symptoms that you are seeing, so that is going to be the gold standard for diagnosis of drug-induced lupus erythematosus. And treatment is, of course, going to be the same. You are going to treat by discontinuing the offending drug. That's all. Uh, meanwhile, if you want to treat that arthralgia and serocytes, you can use a short dose of NSAIDs or maybe a little bit of steroids might help. But anyway, the treatment of choice is going to be discontinuation of the offending drug. That's all. And remember, these drugs, whatever you are uh, thinking right now, is not related to any flare up in systemic lupus erythematosus, even though it's believed to be one of the causative agents from the environmental factors. But still, uh, there are multiple trials which have proven that these drugs, if SLE patients do take, they don't result in any much flare of SLE as such. So, this is drug induced lupus erythematosus. And apart from that, we have APLA, that is anti fossil antibody syndrome, which also needs to be uh, you know, like understood. One of the important uh, HLA that is known to have association with APLA syndrome is HLA DR7 to some extent. But even though the validity of this is highly questioned, but still HLA DR7 is something that you need to know for exams. And APLA can be either a primary APLA syndrome or it could be a secondary APLA. One of the important reasons for getting a secondary APLA is systemic lupus erythematosus. Apart from that, even MCDD can produce APLA kind of a picture. Many other conditions can produce APLA. But if you don't have any underlying secondary condition, still if you get an APLA, that's what we refer to as something called as an APLA syndrome. As far as the clinical features are concerned, APLA is going to have four features. So you, usually you can write it in the mnemonic as clot because they're going to produce the clot. So that's why we can remember as clot. So C stands for clotting. Of course, they're going to result in thrombotic manifestations. Remember, Thrombosis can happen in arterial areas as well as venous zones. But even though venous thrombosis is going to be more common compared to that of arterial thrombosis. And uh, L stands for libido reticularis kind of scenario. It's due to thrombosis of the small venules. It can, it is very non-specific. It can be seen in many other conditions. And O stands for obstetric complications we know in the form of recurrent pregnancy loss. And T stands for thrombocytopenia. So perhaps this is one of the few diseases which produces thrombosis with thrombocytopenia. That's really important. So whenever you have a large vessel thrombosis, you have a thrombosis with low platelets, thrombocytopenia. In exam, you have two differential lines. I used to tell this many times. One is the APLA syndrome. And second one, of course, is going to be the uh, HITS. That is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis syndrome. Typically referred to as something called a type 2 HIT. So it's very easy to differentiate in exam. If at all you have a heparin history of heparin use then it goes towards hits diagnosis when you do not have a history of heparin use usually it goes towards a apla diagnosis it's very easy to find out thrombosis with thrombocytopenia even though you might talk about dic in this setting dic is a microvascular thrombosis they don't cause a macro thrombosis like apla and hits cause macrovascular thrombosis dic will cause only microvascular thrombosis all right Fine. After knowing this uh, basic clinical features, what are the antibodies? You know, like we are talking about APLA and what are the antibodies that are associated with APLA? There are three antibodies that are associated with APLA. The first one is the ACL antibody, that is anti-cardiolipin antibody. It can be IgG or IgM. We have the classic anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibody. And the third one, we have something called the lupus anticoagulant. And of course, it's a natural tendency of any student to ask like which of the following antibodies has highest risk of developing thrombosis. So remember, whenever the patients are triple positive, these are called as triple positive APLA, where the patient will have all three antibodies with them, has the maximum risk of getting thrombosis, highest risk of getting thrombosis. That's quite understandable, you know, like uh, you really don't want to uh, have a good knowledge about it. Just guessing, triple positive, highest risk of thrombosis. And among these, if you want to know a single antibody that has highest risk of developing thrombosis, I would offer a lupus anticoagulant that has the maximum chance of developing thrombosis among the three antibodies to uh, note about. There are some other associations also, uh, even though we know the clot, there are some other associations also uh, uh, that are there in patients with uh, APLA antibodies. One is the valve disorders, I told you. There can be valve thickening and there can be development of uh, Lipman Sachs endocarditis and all this stuff are possible. Valve disorders are possible, and Lipman Sachs endocarditis are also associated with APLA antibodies, especially in the setting of a systemic lupus erythematosus. They can be associated with seizures, uh, which means they can be with or without stroke. 
with or without stroke, they can develop seizures. And of course, they are having a high risk of stroke and myocardial infarction and venous thrombosis, which we know that already, which should not be forgotten. And at the same time, they can be associated with the development of severe migraine-like headaches, which is also quite possible. So these are the other associations apart from your uh, the routine clot scenario, which can be associated with this APLA antibodies, which also should be known. But we have one more entity of APLA that's called a CAPS. So what do you mean by CAPS? This is called as catastrophic APLA syndrome. So C here stands for catastrophic. So catastrophic APLA syndrome, we see this kind of cases rarely, maybe uh, two, three cases in a year is quite common in a high volume tertiary center. So this CAPS is otherwise referred to as something called a Asherson syndrome. So remember, this is not Asher-Mann syndrome. I mean, from cardiology, we've been studying something called Asher-Mann phenomenon, then we know Asherson syndrome now. And in OG, you would be studying something called Asher-Mann syndrome. So all these are different. This is Asherson syndrome. So usually in the setting of Asherman syndrome, the patients go for rapid failure. So that is due to thrombosis of different, different uh, organs in the body within a week, which means at least there will be at least two to three organ failures that will be happening within a week very fast. That is due to end organ failure due to thrombosis. And uh, diagnosis needs a high degree of suspicion, very difficult to diagnose. Usually there will be kidney your uh, lung involvement, cardiac involvement, neurological involvement, all these organs will go for failure because of uh, rapid thrombosis of these vessels. That's what we refer to as a catastrophic APLA. And uh, in this setting, uh, usually we make a diagnosis when you don't have any other cause, but uh, your APLA antibodies are strongly positive. Then in that setting, you can diagnose a catastrophic APLA. So you are going to start with IVAG and pulse methylprednisol same treatment because you want to get rid of these antibodies as soon as possible to reduce the organ failure and the usual cause of death in catastrophic apple is cardiopulmonary failure so they'll go for respiratory as well as uh, cardiac failure and cardiopulmonary failure is the usual reason for uh, death in the setting of caps catastrophic apple and apart from that uh, you have some criteria for diagnosing apple so whenever it is a criteria means that should have some value in the sense like with that itself either you should be able to tell the diagnosis or you should have some reason for that. So here the criteria will tell you how to diagnose this APLA. That's why it's important. So currently we have, have a modified Sapporo classification. Initially we had the original Sapporo that was replaced by modified Sapporo classification criteria. This is also referred to as something called the Sydney classification criteria. That's what we use right now. So whatever may be the criteria, the thing is very simple. You should have one clinical feature and one supportive laboratory feature, which means it's plus. You should have one at least clinical feature and at least one laboratory feature to support the diagnosis of antifossil antibody syndrome. So the two clinical features in that at least one should be there is, one is evidence of vascular thrombosis. It could be venous or arterial thrombosis, doesn't matter. Second is recurrent pregnancy loss. And I don't think they'll be asking you the intricacies of the recurrent pregnancy loss because there are some small, small things in that recurrent pregnancy loss itself. But nevertheless, any recurrent pregnancy loss uh, is taken as a clinical indicator of possible APLA. And second, among the three antibodies, you know, like you have the anti cardiolipin antibody IgG and IgM, then you have the anti beta 2 glycoprotein 1 antibody, or you have the lupus anticoagulant. So among these three antibodies, if you have any one, so one of them, and it should be always a plus in the beginning. So one clinical is important and one laboratory is important. Then in that setting, you can take the patient as having a plus syndrome. Depending on whether it's primary or secondary, you can classify and treat further. Doesn't matter. So how can you uh, confirm this lupus anticoagulant? So this, we have ELISA. I, I mean, ACL, IgG, IgM, and anti-beta 2 glycoprotein 1 antibody. We have ELISA to do that. But this lupus antigone to find out, it's uh, something like an indirect way of finding out lupus antigone. We don't really have ELISA. When you suspect a lupus antigone, the first area where you can suspect lupus antigone is a patient who's having a elevated APTT. They'll have an increased APTT. Remember, this is like a um, paradox, isn't it? Lupus antigone, actually, they're going to produce thrombosis in vivo, which means inside the body, they're going to produce thrombosis, but in vitro, they are producing elevated APTT. This is a sort of a paradox. Uh, I mean, uh, it's it's not uh, what you expect. Inside the body, it's thrombosis. Outside the body, it is actually showing elevated APTT. 
that's a double phase of this lupus anticoagulant so whenever there is an elevated apd there are multiple differential diagnoses so one probably there could be a clotting factor deficiency there are two possibilities clotting factor deficiency or second it could be a clotting factor inhibitor so any one could be there so you want to find it out so it's easy to find out i'll tell you how but before that why they are producing elevated apd that's the question the reason is because the name suggests it's an anti phospholipid antibody apla it's an anti phospholipid antibody so which means uh, in the laboratory to measure apd you use phospholipids so when you're going to use phospholipids and these antibodies are basically going to inhibit the phospholipids means uh, of course the apd will be elevated because phospholipids are integral components of finding out the uh, action of uh, clotting factors in the laboratory and if you are going to inhibit the phospholipids apd values will be apparently high and will be showing high only but inside the body why phospholipids and i mean antibodies against phospholipids are producing thrombosis because phospholipids are rich in many cells especially platelets are rich in phospholipids once you damage this phospholipids inside the platelets the platelets might break down and they leak the contents producing thrombosis one phenomenon and second that also explains the thrombocytopenia as well where the platelets are getting damaged and you're getting thrombocytopenia because they are anti phospholipid antibodies which are present within the platelets to synthesize lot of other compounds nevertheless don't worry and this this phospholipids are present in high uh, amounts in the collagen also in the subendothelial area also so because of endothelial damage because it's caused by these antibodies that also is one reason why you can develop a thrombosis in this setting but anyways in vitro they are producing elevated apd but in vivo they'll be having thrombosis only so now how will you differentiate whether it's a clotting factor deficiency or a clotting factor inhibitor the best example of a clotting factor inhibitor is this apple antibodies lupus anticoagulant so in this setting we do something called a 50 50 mix so where we mix normal plasma 50 percentage remember 50 percentage of normal plasma or normal clotting factor is enough to normalize the apd you don't need 100 percentage of the clotting factor to be intact to produce a normal apd to produce a normal apd just 40 to 50 percentage of clotting factor is enough so when you are doing this 50 50 sort of a mix when you are mixing the patient's plasma with a normal plasma which contains that clotting factors now if the apd normalizes then it usually indicates a clotting factor deficiency in this scenario so you can think about some uh, clotting factor deficiency like a, i mean it could be a hemophilia a or hemophilia b or something like that suppose if the apd does not normalize apd does not normalize in this scenario we think about a clotting factor inhibitor so there are many clotting factor inhibitors are there usually clotting factor inhibitors are acquired rather than uh inherited and there are usually two different types of clotting factor inhibitors one is it could be a factor 8 inhibitor or it could be a apla that is we are talking about a lupus anticoagulant so factor 8 inhibitors can be found out through separate methods so different methods we can find out factor 8 inhibitors we have a lot of elisa techniques are there but as far as apla that lupus anticoagulant is concerned we have some specific tests that need to be known for exams for finding out the lupus anticoagulant in that one of the important tests that we have is the trvbt you know what do you mean by trvbt this is called as dilute russell's wiper venom test called as trvbt it's a dilute russell's wiper venom test trvbt we have that apart from trvbt we have another test called as a kavalin clotting time so that's called a kct so kavalin clotting time these are the two things that are advocated by the guidelines to be used and apart from that we have another test also that's called a dilute prothrombin time these are three different types of tests which can be used to find out the uh, you know like lupus anticoagulant so dilute russell wiper venom test kavalin clotting time and dilute prothrombin time even though dilute prothrombin time is not advocated by the guidelines but still you need to know so what are the indicators of having a lupus anticoagulant if you have a thrombosis in vivo but elevated apd in vitro and uh, if you have a Uh, unresolved apd which means the apd does not normalize even with 50 50 mix and one of these three tests is going to tell you that the patient is having a lupus anticoagulant and not a acquired factor 8 inhibitor so this is how you establish the diagnosis of a lupus anticoagulant in the first place that's a little complicated but still it's important to know so how will you treat an apla by the way so now next thing is to know the treatment of apla syndrome there are two things that you need to address one is going to be thrombo i mean thrombosis and second is the 
recurrent pregnancy loss. Both these things has to be addressed. Suppose the patient is asymptomatic. Uh, typically, there is no need to treat these patients and no prophylaxis is generally needed if they don't have any uh, problems because of this Apple antibodies. But remember, uh, even in asymptomatic patients, prophylaxis is indicated. Prophylactic anticoagulation is indicated in the setting of two areas. One is in perioperative period because these patients are still at risk of thrombos in the perioperative period. So perioperative period you can start with heparin. Or in the setting of pregnancy, uh, we can uh, give aspirin. If the patient had not experienced any prior thrombos or recurrent pregnancy loss, just they are having Apple antibodies due to in some incidental uh, investigation showed the presence of Apple antibodies. Patient is asymptomatic. So indications of prophylaxis, these two only. One is perioperative period and second is pregnancy. Apart from that, there is no need for any regular treatment in these guys. Number one. Second, what will do if the patient is symptomatic? Symptomatic can be two things. One is either the patient could have a recurrent pregnancy loss or the patient is suffering from thrombosis. As far as recurrent pregnancy loss is concerned, the gold standard is low molecular weight heparin plus aspirin throughout pregnancy. So this is the gold standard treatment. If the patient is having pregnancy loss because of APLA, even one pregnancy loss is enough. So in that setting, I'm going to start with a low molecular weight heparin plus aspirin. So this should be started as soon as the pregnancy is confirmed, which means ASAP. Even some uh, gynecologists start even before the pregnancy. When they attempt the, for the pregnancy itself, they start this. But guidelines tell that as soon as the pregnancy is confirmed by UPT, you have to uh, uh, start this heparin and low molecular heparin and aspirin. And you have to continue. Till how long you have to continue? You have to continue at least minimum till 34 weeks. You can continue till delivery also, till term also. But uh, minimum you have to continue till. 34 weeks when the fetus achieves lung maturity at this time. That is the guideline. So you have to give low molecular weight heparin plus aspirin. That's the gold standard. So no warfarin here. Okay. If the patient has experienced a thrombosis and if they ask you when uh, do the patients go for recurrent pregnancy loss, when the fetus usually gets lost, it's usually during the second trimester, even though there are a lot of ev ex evidences for first trimester loss also, but second trimester pregnancy loss is going to be the usual common entity. You know very well in your OG you would have studied second trimester pregnancy loss, most common cause is your cervical incompetence and first trimester most common cause is uh, chromosomal abnormalities. One of the important causes of second trimester pregnancy loss is APLA syndrome, but there are evidences to tell that it can happen in the first trimester also. So if the patient has experienced thrombosis, it depends on whether it is an arterial thrombosis or a venous thrombosis. You know, venous thrombosis means it's going to be either a CVT, cortical venous thrombosis, or it could be a DVT or a pulmonary embolism. So these are going to be the usual venous thrombosis. So in this setting, you're going to use only standard treatment. Then I'm not going to use any different guideline here. It's just a standard treatment. That's all. So how you treat a routine CVT and routine uh, DVT and PE, that's how you're going to treat. But remember, at the same time, consider prophylactic lifelong coagulation, lifelong anticoagulation. So that, that's there in the guidelines. Whenever you have a, some thrombophilia underneath, which is proven, and the patient has got a DVT or a pulmonary embolism or a CVT, it's better to always consider lifelong anticoagulation. But remember, whether you will choose Novak or Warfarin. I think I've told you this point in cardiology itself. What will you choose? Whether you'll choose the Novak or Warfarin. Mm -hmm. Let me see the answers that you're giving. So I'm getting a variety of answers. Some are telling Novak, some are telling Warfarin. So what is the answer basically? I told you, uh, there are certain exceptions for use of Novak. We use Warfarin here. Novak's are not preferred, especially in APLA syndrome. There are very few cases where you don't prefer Warfarin. I mean, you don't prefer Novak's and you prefer Warfarin. One of the best example is APLA syndrome. And second, I would have told you it's in a valvular atrial fibrillation where Novak's are not yet approved. And in CVT also, Novak's are not yet approved. Use Warfarin only. But nevertheless, in APLA syndrome, the universal choice is usually Warfarin. We don't really prefer Novak's there because Novak's are considered to be less effective in the setting of uh, APLA syndrome. But apart from that, acute treatment of CVT, DVTP does not change. It's going to be the standard treatment. So as far as arterial thrombosis is concerned, so you have, I mean, we are talking about a stroke here. Stroke and a myocardial infarction. 
as you're talking about. So these are the two major arterial thrombosis we are going to encounter. As far as MI is concerned, you're going to follow the standard guidelines. There is no change at all as far as MI is concerned, which means you're going to use the same thrombolysis. You're going to use the same DAPT for one year, then followed by maybe aspirin for entire life. So same standard guidelines, there's no much change. But when you take a stroke, there will be some difference depending on whether it's a arterial stroke or a, I mean, cardioembolic stroke or a non-cardioembolic stroke. But acute treatment of stroke, again, you follow the standard guidelines. There is no change in the guidelines. But for prophylaxis, we call it a secondary prophylaxis, isn't it? So it depends on whether it's a cardioembolic stroke or a non-cardioembolic stroke. Cardioembolic stroke or a non-cardioembolic stroke. If it's going to be a cardioembolic stroke, the best treatment option is going to be warfarin with an INR of 2 to 3. Uh, that's where I'm going to maintain for lifelong most of the times. Warfarin with an INR of 2 to 3. And if it's going to be a non-cardioembolic stroke in this setting, there are three options are there. I can uh, give a dual antiplatelet therapy that is aspirin and clopidogrel together. This is considered to be the better option to reduce the risk of bleeding. Along with that, I can, I mean, or I can use warfarin with an INR of 2 to 3 plus aspirin which is inferior compared to that of warfarin alone with an INR of three to four. So there are three studies that have been done separately for all these things, but uh, all the studies have concluded that uh, DAPT is okay and uh, non-inferior compared to the other treatment options. So currently for all non-cardioembolic strokes, even with APLA syndrome, we use DAPT only, dual antiplatelet therapy. Only for cardioembolic strokes, which means we talk about atrial fibrillation in the setting or if there is a clot that is formed in the uh, atrium because of APLA syndrome. So in that setting, you can give warfarin. But if it's a non-cardiambolic stroke, your DAPT is superior compared to your routine use of warfarin. So these are the guidelines. But nevertheless, I don't think they will ask you more about thrombosis because it's very tough guideline. Usually, question will be based on the treatment of recurrent pregnancy loss in uh, APLA syndrome. Tell me what is the most common cause of acquired thrombophilia in the world? First of all, you need to know what do you mean by congenital thrombophilia, hereditary thrombophilia, but what is the most common cause of acquired thrombophilia in the world? What is the answer for that? Yes, the most common cause of acquired thrombophilia in the world is APLA syndrome. The most common cause of inherited thrombophilia in the world is factor failure and mutation. We know that. Most common cause of acquired thrombophilia in the world is APLA syndrome only, even now. Inherited is factor failure. Okay. Now, we are moving on to the next uh, CDD, that is systemic sclerosis. Systemic sclerosis, or we can call it as a scleroderma. Remember, this is basically a female predominant disease again, which is seen in the ratio of 3 to 1. So again, it's a female predominant disease. And uh, basically, systemic sclerosis is a vascular disease. Many students think that it's a cutaneous disease. But this is a perfect example of being a vascular disease, which means the problem is in the vasculature and the endothelium, not in the skin or in the subcutaneous tissue. This vascular disease is the primary event that is happening in the setting of uh, systemic sclerosis. And uh, this results in something called endothelial injury, which is again a primary event in the setting of systemic sclerosis. Because of endothelial injury, uh, they can go for a reactive skin fibrosis because this endothelial injury will result in hypoxia locally. Because of local hypoxia, it is thought that this activates the lot of fibrogenic pathways, especially TGF beta dependent pathways. So fibroblasts will be activated. And uh, that is the reason for development of skin fibrosis subsequently. So there is so much of evidence that scleroderma is a vascular disease, which means majority of, the, not majority, almost all of the scleroderma patients will have an underlying Raynaud phenomenon, which means Raynaud phenomenon is going to be the uh, one of the first features in scleroderma. So which means that's going to be one of the main things. So that tells you that it's a primary vascular disease. In fact, many of the patients with scleroderma start their disease with Raynaud's phenomenon only. Raynaud's phenomenon is one of the quintessential clinical feature that you should never miss out in the setting of a scleroderma. Even before the skin thickening starts, Raynaud's phenomenon will start. So it's clearly telling you that it's a vascular disease. Apart from that, the nail bed capillaries will be low. So we'll be seeing that that's called a nail, I mean, capillary dropout will be there. So there's so many evidences to tell that scleroderma is basically a vascular disease. And the primary event is basically endothelial injury. And the skin fibrosis acts only as a reaction to this. 
hypoperfusion and hypoxia that is happening uh, in that particular area clear and uh, one of the most important compound that is involved in the development of this hypoxia and endothelial injury is the endothelin 1 and we have tgf beta so if they ask you what are the compounds that play a major role in the setting of development of skin fibros i'll go for these compounds endothelin 1 and tgf beta if, i mean remember in any medical scenario if they ask you the most pathogen always endothelin 1 in mi if they ask you which endothelin is pathogenic endothelin 1 in pulmonary artery hypertension which endothelin is pathogenic is endothelin 1 and even in systemic slows if they ask you which endothelin is pathogenic that is again it is endothelin 1 so endothelin is one one is one of the very pathogenic endothelins at the same time scleroderma pathophysiology is not completely understood but even though we know that uh, endothelial injury is the primary event and hypoxia is causing the reactive skin fibrosis but we don't know what is the primary trigger for the endothelial injury. Probably some viruses could be there, some environmental reasons could be there. We have no idea about that. And how all these pathways are integrated, there are complex pathophysiologies there, but none of them are important for the exams, nevertheless. So the most important thing is to understand is the basic endothelial injury that's causing a reactive skin fibrosis. As far as scleroderma is concerned, you have some classification is there. So it's not systemic sclerosis. I'm going to start with a term called scleroderma. And it has some uh, classification. So scleroderma can be classified into something called a localized scleroderma and you have something called a generalized scleroderma. These forms of generalized scleroderma is what we refer to as systemic sclerosis. Number one, the name systemic sclerosis because it's a generalized scleroderma. Localized scleroderma again can be divided into two. One is called as a morphia and second one we have something called a linear scleroderma. As far as Morphia is concerned, which is again classified into three. One is called a circumscribed morphia. Second one, we have something called a generalized morphia. And the third one, we have something called a pansclerotic morphia. So we have three different types of morphia. These are a localized form of skin thickening. Uh, that's something different. We shall be talking about in some time. Then as far as the linear scleroderma is concerned, the most important form of linear scleroderma that you will be getting in this exam is what we something called as a n coup. I mean, it's not called n. There's a French, so we call it as an coup de sabre. So this is the usual thing that they'll be asking in exam. This kind of linear scleroderma that uh, happens in the form of a sickle in the ophthalmic region of the trigeminal nerve in the face in the frontal region so there will be form of a sickle shaped linear kind of a skin thickening in the area of skin thickening you might have a small hair loss also alopecia also because of the fibrotic area so that's very common uh you know like image that you get in your exams as well that's called n coup de sabre so usually the most important feature of this localized forms of scleroderma is the fact that they do not have raynaud's phenomenon that's very very important raynaud's is not a feature at the same time they will not have internal organ involvement so which means they affect only the skin and the pathophysiology is a little different probably local vascular apoplexy resultant local hypoxia maybe the reason why they develop these local forms of skin thickening but nevertheless they don't have any generalized vascular involvement which means there's no Raynaud's phenomenon and no internal organ involvement the prognosis is okay it's they're going to do very well and only localized therapies are enough. For example, if it's going to be a morphia, you're going to treat with, for example, a PUA therapy is enough. You know what is PUA? That is solar and ultraviolet. That's going to be more than enough. If you're going to have a generalized scleroderma or a generalized systemic sclerosis, in this setting, uh, depending on uh, uh, whether skin involvement is there or not, which means there is no skin involvement, only internal organ involvement is there. Only internal organ involvement is there or if the patient is having skin involvement plus internal organ involvement so even though the skin involvement plus internal organ involvement is the commonest form but there can be few cases where you don't get any skin involvement at all but you can have only internal organ involvement called as sine scleroderma sine scleroderma that's a name that is given to scleroderma very rare form of scleroderma that has only internal organ involvement very difficult to find out usually the diagnosis of sine scleroderma can be found out only if someone suspects this disease and does a biopsy of some organ or if uh, the patient has died only after the autopsy you can see fibros of different different areas and you can find out the sine scleroderma otherwise it's very difficult to uh, even suspect and maybe with the help of Raynaud's from you can find out but otherwise it's very difficult to find out 
as far as this skin and internal organ involvement is concerned this is what is going to be the most common form of scleroderma overall and which can be further divided into something called a diffuse form of scleroderma and here something called a limited form of scleroderma diffuse and limited form of scleroderma so i mean we have some differences between diffuse form and limited form which we'll be discussing subsequently before that uh, you have to know what do you mean by diffuse and what do you mean by limited whenever the skin involvement is limited to the distal areas especially the distal to the elbows and the knees if it's a, if it's limited distal to the elbows and knees we called as limited scleroderma if the skin involvement is not limited to distal areas but it's also extending back into the proximal areas it's called a diffuse scleroderma remember face is an exception face can be involved in both limited as well as uh, diffuse varieties so which means face and neck are an exception face and neck can be involved in both limited and diffuse varieties but uh, whether it is only in the distal or it's in the distal as well as proximal it will tell you whether it's a diffuse or limited for example if the skin thickening is seen in the trunk axilla and in those areas i'll be going for a limit i mean diffuse involvement but diffuse also can have this skin involvement in the distal areas no like additional to distal they will have proximal involvement also so that is diffuse scleroderma limited only distal but face and uh, neck can have can happen in both uh, diffuse as well as limited so first we need to know about the uh, you know like general features of scleroderma what are the clinical features that you typically develop in setting of scleroderma and remember most of the times as opposed to the localized variety of scleroderma generalized scleroderma will have raynaud's phenomenon for sure and they will be having internal organ involvement so this is the basic difference between this localized forms of scleroderma and the generalized forms of scleroderma in reality so now we need to know the different uh, findings different features of uh, scleroderma and we are talking only about the generalized form so now we are not going to talk about the localized form if you really want to know on the localized forms and you know everyone knows this is a typical example of a Levator reticularis type of a rash, where you can see this kind of a lazy pattern. You can see this kind of dilated venules. This is typical levator reticularis type of a rash. And um, yes, so this is an example of a localized form of scleroderma. We know that. So, for example, if you see uh, this, is a perfect example of a morphia that you are seeing here. So this is a linear patch of skin thickening that you're seeing here and you don't you don't have hair in this area very properly that's a kind of alopecia that you get in that area and one problem with this is it might uh, sometimes can cause eye involvement so the, the ocular problem can happen in this setting if it's involving the eyes but apart from that it doesn't create any much problem and this is a form of a morphia i mean this is what we refer to as that uh, on coupe de sabre that means i think sickle in french i really don't know french somebody who know french you can tell what do you mean by encope de sabre and this is a form of a linear scleroderma sorry this is not linear sorry uh, this is a form of a morphia morphia this is a circumscribed local area of skin thickening that's called morphia all right so this is another example which you need to know fine cool reduce telling sward I don't know, and uh, Sanju is telling we know only one thing in French. Okay, Sanju knows only kiss in French. I think I even know how to pronounce kiss in French. If somebody knows, you can tell. And uh, I think Messi, Messi is French, right? Thank you. Is that is so? I think Riju knows French, I guess. So Messi means thank you, right? Oh, is that correct? Okay, fine. So I know only one or two words <laughs> in French. I think I, my uh, secondary language is not French uh, in my uh, school. My secondary language is uh, English, and my primary language is Tamil. That's all, basically. Okay, fine. So this is what you're going to get in the setting of scleroderma. So I told you two pictures of that morphia and linear scleroderma. And they both they are treated with uh, local meshes and more conservative meshes. And let us see overall clinical features of scleroderma. What all you will see? Then I'll uh, come back to you. But are the, what are the overall clinical features? First is the skin involvement. Skin is the most common organ involved in scleroderma. If we ask overall, skin is the most common organ. I mean, you can argue that vessels, but we are talking from practical point of view. So what are the uh, features that you will see in the screen? So typically you will see this kind of uh, tightening of the skin 
thickening of the skin. So that will be the clues in exam, tightening, thickening. And more often you will be getting edema. This edema in the exam, they will be usually using the word called puffy hands. That's very characteristic. I mean, that's how the MLE papers describe and that's how the Indian papers also are going to depict. So the puffy kind of fingers, that's what is going to happen. And more often there will be sclerodactyly, that is uh, thickening of the entire digits might happen. And uh, apart from that, you might be uh, seeing some changes in the face also. The characteristic features of the face are called as something called a rat-like face or a mouse-like face. Uh, which you'll be seeing what is the i mean what is that typically we will be seeing that so in the face again you'll be seeing skin thickening and uh, they might look young actually than they really are because of the loss of wrinkles because they lose that wrinkles because the fibrosis they might actually look younger than they really are so number one apart from that they will have a scenario like a uh, thin lips might have and around surrounding the lips, they might be having something called radial furrowing. I'll show you the image. Once I show you the image, you'll be understanding much better. So radial furrowing will be there. So there'll be a lip and there'll be a surrounding radial furrowing. Again, that's a sign of a fibrosis. And apart from that, they can have dental malocclusion and they'll lose teeth because of the fibrosis of the gingival area. Dental malocclusion. And they will lose lips and I mean lose teeth and sometimes because of dental malocclusion the teeth may look very sharp and uh, typically they you know like appear like that kind of mouse like appearance. So this kind of facies is what we refer to as something called as a Moscow facies. I think in Russian Russian I think Moscow means mouse. So that's why these faces are referred to as something called a Moscow facies, mouse like facies, dental malocclusion. All these things will be there. So let us see the face and come back once, how they look like. This is a typical Moscow faces that you're talking about. There will be a beak like nose. We can talk Sri Devi sort of a nose also. But I mean, with no disrespect to the legend already, but uh, it looks like that, isn't it? So that's like a beak like nose. We call it as a pinched nose. Then the, uh, you know, like they will have thinning of lips like this, and you can have this kind of radial furrowing that's otherwise referred to something called a tobacco pouch appearance so these are characteristic mocks moscow face and you can see the teeth isn't it over here you can see the teeth so one teeth is protruding out i mean that's because of dental malocclusion that these patients are experiencing so these are typical moscow faces and um, these are the images of the hands of the scleroderma patients where you can see uh, these patients are basically having uh, this sort of this thickening of the skin and you can see how shiny they look like and this is an example of a puffy skin so of your ready matter skin and you can also see because of the severe vascular ischemia you can see some uh, digital infarcts as well that's very common in patients which we'll be discussing subsequently at the same time because of recurrent digital infarcts the digits look might look actually shorter uh, the, because of the bone resorption, because of severe hypoxia, their different digits may look with different, different lengths. So that kind of malformation and disfiguration might happen. And you can see this patient is also having one uh, calcification of the skin that's called calcinosis cutis. And there's another example of calcinosis cutis here. And this is another example of a telangiectasia. So telangiectasias are extremely common in the setting of a scleroderma as well. So, so we can write now. So what are the features that we'll be seeing in the setting of a scleroderma patient. So what are the other skin features? They can get telangiectasias, all right, in the skin. They can get calcinosis cutis, calcification in different areas of the skin, common finding in many scleroderma patients. And after some time, this thickening and tightening of the skin may lead to contractures. And uh, because of severe ischemia, they can go for bone loss and uh, they can go for shortening of the digits itself in the first place. And in the face, they look completely expressionless because if they wanted to smile, they cannot smile because of the thickening and the fibrous of the skin. It's a very tough disease to take, isn't it? And at the same time, if it happens in the hands, these contractures can lead to a limited range of motion as well. The range of motion will be extremely limited. That leads to a very important sign called as prayer sign. And that's been described in some textbooks where if the patients want to do prayer, they will not be able to do like this because their skin is thickened and they cannot, uh, because of contractures, they cannot flex the, uh, you know, like joints just like that. 
and uh, typically this prayer sign has been described in diabetes patients not in scleroderma patients but that's extrapolated to scleroderma but in diabetes patients especially those who are having something called diabetic chiroarthropathy c h e i r o chiroarthropathy those patients cannot do this so that's what we called as a prayer sign that can be extrapolated to scleroderma patients also and you can tell that these patients can also have something called a prayer sign so as far as the skin involvement is concerned we have one scoring system called as modified rodnan scoring system modified rodnan score, scoring system uh, i think everyone knows ronan only i don't think somebody knows rodnan people who are uh, marvel fans definitely know who ronan is okay fine these are the uh, skin involvement that you're going to see in the setting of a scleroderma so skin is one of the very very common organs yes sankhya told already guardians of the galaxy yes the first uh, seg- uh, edition of guardians of galaxy is one of the very important villains isn't it okay so skin skin thickening so apart from skin you can have a sort of a joint involvement also musculoskeletal involvement So as far as joint involvement is concerned, they can produce arthralgia and arthritis. Once again, this arthritis is typically non-erosive. They don't produce erosions unless until you have a high titus or rheumatoid factor or ACP, you don't get erosion. So this is another example of a non-erosive form of an arthritis. And apart from that, uh, you can also uh, get something called a tendon friction rubs. usually presence of tendon friction rubs is a indication of high grade disease high severity disease but this is also one of the important findings tendon friction rubs that happen that can happen in the setting of scleroderma usually indicates a high severity or a very active disease that's a very important point there and uh, they can go for deformities over a period of time and they can go for bone resorption bone resorption as well and uh, this bone resorption as you know is going to happen in the most distal areas because of the ischemia and that's what we refer to as something called acroosteolysis acroosteolysis this together can result in a very common finding that is there will be shortening of the digits the digit span will be low so the digits will be shortened abnormally and they look like rat only literally the deformities short digits so you can imagine like a mouse you can imagine like a rat that's why the name have come so they look like a rat and in in many perspective apart from that these people can develop myositis also so remember even though you can ask me the arthritis is basically non erosive form of arthritis only but still they get this kind of acroosteolysis that is due to bone resorption that happens due to ischemia so not really due to the arthritis and if they ask you which area the arthritis is extremely common the most common joint that is involved as far as scleroderma is concerned is the wrist joint it can involve mcp it can involve pip it can involve the same rheumatoid distribution also but the most common joint involved as far as systemic sclerosis is concerned is the wrist joint and acroosteolysis most commonly happens in the distal phalanx i mean that's why the name came acroosteolysis so it happens usually in the distal phalangeal area and uh, let us see some of the images of acroosteolysis if you want to yeah this is an example of acroosteolysis in this scenario so one thing what you are seeing is typically this patient is actually suffering from a raynaud that you can see here and at the same time they are having uh, this kind of mouse like digits can see uh, this is due to resorption we are seeing this kind of digits you know like very ugly looking digits isn't it so that is due to distal bone resorption acroosteolysis and this is clearly seen in this particular image where uh, you can see that there is a lot of resorption of the distal phalanx that has happened that is because of severe hypoxemia ischemia and many digits are looking abnormal because the bone has been resorbed almost near completely in the distal area so these are basic examples of acroosteolysis that happens in the setting of scleroderma okay then myositis myositis can happen in the setting of scleroderma uh, in two areas one whenever there is a myositis you suspect probably overlap syndrome because it could have associated polymyositis or it could be a mixed contagious disorder also 
So which means either you suspect some overlap syndrome with polymyositis or it could be a mixed conduit disorder. Or uh, second thing is whenever there is a myositis, it increases the risk of having myocardial involvement. So that's another thing. We'll be discussing about that in idiopathic inflammatory myositis in a short while. And uh, you know, what is the myositis antibody? Can you tell what is the, I mean, what is this overlap syndrome antibody, which you have discussed? If you have attended carefully, you should be able to tell. What is the overlap syndrome antibody? No, that's not even RNP. Even RNP is for MCTD, not for overlap syndrome. I'm asking about overlap antibody with polymyositis. Yes, that is anti PMSL antibody. That's what I'm talking about here. PMSL antibody, uh, otherwise referred to as something called an anti exosomal antibody. I mean, I, I don't know whether I've told you this name or not. I thought, I suddenly thought that I didn't tell. So that's why I told you. It's otherwise called as anti exosomal antibody. That's the overlap antibody you're talking about, anti PMSL, which is going to have that typical nuclear kind of a pattern in the immunofluorescence. Apart from myositis, they can have something called a vascular involvement. As far as vascular involvement is concerned, we know the most important thing is going to be the Raynaud's phenomenon. And every single scleroderma patient will have this Raynaud's phenomenon. And remember, this is not a primary Raynaud's. We know that it's going to be a secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, of course. Remember, you don't get this in a localized scleroderma. You get only in a generalized scleroderma, systemic sclerosis. I told you that point as well. And uh, the patients can develop pulmonary artery hypertension. I mean, I'll tell you where pulmonary hypertension will be common after some time. But pulmonary artery hypertension is also one of the important, um, you know, like vascular uh, phenomenon in scleroderma and it's a type 1 pulmonary artery hypertension as per the Dana point uh, consensus we'll be discussing that in pulmonary medicine if possible so type 1 pulmonary hypertension that's pulmonary arterial hypertension it's an arterial vasoconstriction and uh, thickening of the arterial walls and there will be resultant narrowing of the uh, arterial lumen so that's what we called as a type 1 pulmonary arterial hypertension and apart from that you can have something called a renal involvement. As far as the renal involvement is concerned, the most important renal involvement is the SRC, that is scleroderma renal crisis, which I'll be talking about that in some time. And they can produce something called a type two distal RTA, possible, but more important is the scleroderma renal crisis, which you need to have a great deal of discussion, but we'll be doing that later on. Then we can have the gastrointestinal tract involvement, G8 involvement. As far as the GAT involvement is concerned, the most common is going to be the severe GRD that these patients will encounter. Because of GRD, they will be having severe erosive form of esophagitis. That's because of the acid reflux. And one of the important reasons for this is the gastroesophageal motility and they will have a lax ileus. Suppose if you're going to do a manometry, the characteristic finding in scleroderma will be reduced peristalsis with reduced LES pressure, LES tone. So this is a characteristic feature of a scleroderma esophagus. That's called a scleroderma esophagus itself. That's a manometry that is typical of scleroderma esophagus. Whenever you see a reduced peristalsis with increased LES tone, what is the disease? What kind of disease you are looking there, looking at that particular scenario? And you should be able to tell. It's very easy. Reduced peristalsis with increased LES tone. Yes, of course it is achalasia. Correct. It's achalasia. So that's why in exam, that's important to differentiate. So scleroderma will have a reduced peristalsis with a reduced LES tone. So because of this kind of a lax LES tone, these patients are going to definitely develop this kind of GRD because I've seen some patients who lie down as it comes out of their mouth. That's a very tough scenario. Remember, most of the CTDs are very bad. You know, like you don't curse someone to get a CTD. I mean, as far as I know, you curse someone to get probably a prostate cancer. Okay, you curse someone probably to get even a HIV, but you don't uh, curse someone to get a CTD. You know, like HIV right now has a better prognosis. You know, like they can live at least till their entire uh, life into in, with a normal lifespan because now the drugs, if they're taking it correctly and if there is a luck, there is a chance they can live for 30, 40 years. So, yeah. So, fine. So, I mean, many uh, scientists, I think who told that word, you know, like, there's one famous scientist you're going to find out who's told that HIV is better than diabetes mellitus. He's one of the giants in diabetes. He told that HIV is much better than diabetes mellitus because diabetes is going to kill you slowly, step by step. Vascular, vascular problem, microvascular complications, macrovascular complications, you'll be in the hospital full time. Nevertheless, no need to worry about that.
So reduced peristalsis with reduced LES tone is extremely classical of uh, JT involvement of uh, scleroderma. And that is uh, the classical scleroderma esophageal that I'm going to look out for. And these patients can develop something called esophageal dysmotility as well. Because of that, uh, because of the motility of the esophages will not be proper. They can go for dysphagia. They cannot eat their food properly. There will be odinophagia, painful swallowing, and they can uh, develop a sort of aspiration also because the food does not go into the uh, GIT properly and they can come into the respiratory tract. And apart from that, they don't only have esophageal dysmotility, they can have gastric dysmotility and they can have intestinal dysmotility as well. And, uh, and this intestinal dysmotility causes severe constipation in these patients, severe constipation, and uh, they can result in malabsorption as well. And one of the important reasons for development of malabsorption is the something called uh, SIBO. Everyone knows what you mean by SIBO. This is called a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That's otherwise referred to as a bacterial overgrowth syndrome. That is because you can imagine like stools that are getting accumulated in the intestine for a longer, longer period of time. So there'll be a bacterial overgrowth in the local area resulting in development of something called a SIBO. And this gastric dysmotility can result in severe bloating and the patient will not be able to push the food out of their stomach. And at the same time, they can also result in uh, early satiety. Which means even if they wanted to eat, they cannot eat. What a terrible disease, man. You, you lie down, you don't get peace. You want to eat something, you can't eat. Even if you eat, you get pain and you cannot swallow. Even if you swallow, you cannot digest that. Even if you digest that, it's going to result in bacterial overgrowth. Terrible disease. Don't curse anyone to get this kind of disease. It's going to kill you inch by inch, millimeter by millimeter. And uh, these are some of the diseases like SLE, if it's going to be severe. And uh, this kind of scleroderma-like uh, disease, they are going to make you feel why you are born in your life. I mean, why you want this life in the first place. Yes, Venus Williams had it. So GIT involvement is there. So GIT involvement is extremely common. It's going to be there in almost 80 to 85 percentage of the patients. So it means it's extremely common. It's not like uncommon. And many of the scleroderma patients will have some form of GIT involvement. And uh, we, I think we discussed about the musculoskeletal involvement already. Then we had to know about the cardiac involvement. So what about the cardiac involvement that these patients are going to have? So they can go for myocardial fibrosis. That's why scleroderma is one of the important cause of restrictive cardiomyopathy. We know that they can cause this. Apart from that, they can, because the RCM, they can go for conduction abnormalities and they can re result in development of sudden cardiac death as well. And pericardial effusion is possible, but rare. It's not very common in the setting of scleroderma, but still you need to know this conduction abnormality and restrictive cardiomyopathy. And uh, as far as the lungs are concerned, scleroderma can produce as a sign of, I mean, form of pulmonary fibrosis, that is idiopathic, I mean, uh, interstitial lung disease. And they ask you the most common histological pattern of this kind of pulmonary fibrosis is going to be NSIP. That is non-specific interstitial pneumonia. That's the most common form. We saw in rheumatoid arthritis, it's going to be UIP. SLE, I didn't tell you, but still it's NSIP. Scleroderma, again, it's NSIP, the most common form. NSIP generally tends to respond to steroids. That's the overall goal. But UIP has a poor response to steroids. NSIP has a better response to steroids. But again, NSIP has two different types. The traditional classic NSIP is that then there is something called a fibrogenic form of NSIP. The fibrosing NSIP forms usually does not respond well. That's why the that underscores the importance of doing a lung biopsy to find out what is the type and whether they will respond to steroids or not. That's very important. And they can have some endocrine issues also. So like, for example, Females, very common, isn't it? so they can go for amenorrhea because of the tube fibrosis, the uterine fibrosis, the cervical tract stenosis, a lot of things can happen. And they can develop uh, a sort of thyroid issues, especially in the setting of high, I mean, uh, they can produce that riddle thyroidist kind of picture where they can go for thyroid fibrosis, which can subsequently result in hypothyroidism. But usually they'll be euthyroid only, but rarely they can result in development of hypothyroidism as well. So I think we have discussed all the features of scleroderma from top to bottom. Okay. Cool. I think I've told you everything. Now it's better to move on to the distinction. So we saw a lot of common features. I mean, these features, whatever I told you right now, can happen in any form of scleroderma. 
I mean, when you talk about a systemic sclerosis, everything can happen. All the features I've told you can happen in the setting of this, where is that? Science scleroderma also. The only thing is science scleroderma is there will be no skin involvement. That's all. Nothing else. Apart from that, whatever the internal organ involvement I told you can happen in the setting of science scleroderma as well. But let us uh, compare these two common things. So is there any difference? Remember, again, I'm telling you, even if I'm going to compare between this limited form of scleroderma versus the diffuse form of scleroderma, you have to be very, very clear in one thing that almost everything, whatever I told you can happen in any form of scleroderma. Whenever I tell this happens in increased incidence, you have to take an exact way that this happens in increased incidence. It doesn't mean this will happen only in that particular area. So that's the take home point. So first of all, what is the definition? So remember the in limited scleroderma, skin involvement will be limited to distal to the knees and elbows. This is the definition. We're talking about a skin thickening here. Based on skin thickening, that will be limited to distal to the knees and elbows. But here it will be distal as well as proximal. It will be involving distal to the knees and elbows as well as proximal areas like, for example, trunk also will be involved. Trunk, axilla, shoulders, chest area, these also can be involved. But remember, the common thing is the face and the neck. The face and the neck can be present in both. So that will not tell you whether it's a limited variety or a diffuse variety. We talk about the constitutional symptoms. Constitutional symptoms like fatigue, weight loss, uh, mild fever, and anorexia. They are extremely um, common in the setting of diffuse variety, rare in the setting of a limited variety. At the same time, uh, if you have, if you take the organ involvement, let us see the pulmonary involvement. This is the most important as far as exams are concerned. Pulmonary involvement, it's going to be uh, common it can happen in both. So pulmonary involvement can happen in both, but in the limited variety, the pulmonary artery hypertension is going to be the most important. Whereas in diffuse variety, the IELD is going to be the most important. That is because of the antibodies that they have, which we'll be discussing after some time. So I can write the pH is more than ILD here. And the ILD is more than pulmonary artery hypertension here. Which doesn't mean that's the only the pH that happens here and ILD is the only thing that happens here. Both can happen in both, but high propensity for pH in limited variety and high propensity for developing ILD in diffuse variety. As far as gastrointestinal tract symptoms are concerned, so both can have that uh, kind of GA dysmotility, I mean, esophageal dysmotility, GA dysmotility, then GRD, that one is common for both. So you cannot differentiate based on that. But one thing that happens in limited variety more compared to the systemic diffuse variety is the primary biliary cirrhosis, which is very rare in the setting of a diffuse variety, PBC, primary biliary cirrhosis, kind of a picture. And as far as renal involvement is concerned, Renal involvement, uh, SRC is very rare. It can happen usually very late in the course of the disease. But scleroderma renal crisis is extremely common and it can happen early in the course of the disease. That's as for renal involvement. And as far as the cardiac involvement is concerned, usually cardiac involvement is rare in the setting of limited variety, whereas it's very, very common in the setting of diffuse variety. In the sense, uh, I can tell that these patients will have very early and faster Restrictive cardiomyopathy. As far as the overall survival is concerned, survival is concerned, it is good actually. Overall survival is better and good with uh, limited forms of scleroderma. Like for example, average, you know, like there will be 80% of the patients will be alive at 10 years. So it's a re I mean, reasonably good survival rate. But as far as the, I mean, diffuse variety of scleroderma is concerned, only 40 percentage, I remember as half, just 80, 40, 40 percentage will be alive at 10 years of age. I mean, 10 years from the date of diagnosis, which means it's not really good. It's a bad disease and everything will start early and the quality of life also is going to be much worse with the limit, I mean, diffuse variety of scleroderma. That's why it's bad. And apart from that, uh, here's some characteristic name for limited variety. Previous limited variety was called as something called as Crest syndrome. So everyone knows what is what you mean by Crest syndrome. So I don't think I need to explain what you mean by Crest syndrome. Crest syndrome C stands for calcinosis and R stands for Raynaud's and E stands for esophageal dysmotility and S stands for sclerodactyly and uh, T stands for telangiectasia. Telangiectasia. So this is the Crest syndrome. And the original name for uh, this limited variety of scleroderma is what we refer to as something called a Crest syndrome. So in exam, you might get a question like this, uh, where they can tell that uh, a patient who is having a anti-syndromeric antibody, 
is known to have one of the following. They can give Crest syndrome instead of limited scleroderma. But limited scleroderma is the right name. Crest syndrome is a name that should be abolished. But uh, let us see. So if you talk about the particular Crest syndrome features, that's extremely common in limited variety. But here only the Raynaud's is common compared to all the others. Raynaud's is the only thing that is common in uh, diffuse variety. And uh, of course, as far as the antibodies are concerned, because that antibodies are going to be really, really important. So what are the antibodies that you're going to see? The most important antibody as far as your uh, limited variety is concerned is the ACA, that is anti-centromeric antibody that's going to produce that kind of uh, centromeric pattern in your ANA immunofluorescence. And uh, we know here it's going to be the anti topoism is one antibody, otherwise referred to as anti-SCL70 antibody. That's going to be the most important, the diffuse variety. So you know what kind of pattern this anti topoism is one antibody will produce. This produces a kind of a speckled appearance. That speckled pattern is very common. Remember, if you see the natural history of the disease, for example, natural course of the disease, let us see how they will fare. Let me draw a graph. So for example, uh, if you take the years after the diagnosis of scleroderma, usually initially, they'll be coming with Raynaud's only. But after a very long time, like it might take around uh, uh, five years, around five years mark, they'll get the skin thickening. And even it will take a much more longer time. Like for example, it might take even longer time after development of skin thickening by around 15 to 20 years from the time of development of Raynaud's, they will develop pulmonary artery hypertension and they will die subsequently. So this is a natural history as far as the limited variety is concerned. So pulmonary evidence happens very late. But most of the patients with uh, this kind of diffuse variety of scleroderma, usually at the time of diagnosis itself, they'll be having Raynaud's as well as skin thickening. And within a short period of time, they'll start developing internal organ involvement. Maybe within three to five years. Within three to five years, they start developing internal organ involvement. For example, ILD. Example I'm telling then they can develop many other internal organ involvement also. So that is why the quality of life and the survival both are going to be a little bad in the setting of diffuse variety of scleroderma. That's the importance of uh, identifying these two varieties. And there are many different antibodies are there as far as uh, systemic sclerosis is concerned, but these are these two are the most important antibodies, anti-centromere antibodies and uh, anti topoisomerase isomerase one antibodies. And one more antibody that tends to be extremely common in the setting of scleroderma is anti-RNA polymerase three antibodies. These anti-RNA polymerase 3 antibodies have a very important connection with the scleroderma renal crisis. And similarly, this anti topoisomerase antibodies are having very important connection with the ILD. So you can remember like that also. So that's why they get fast ILD and fast SRC. Faster ILD. And ACA has a close association with, so I would write this way. Of course, they'll be having closer association with pulmonary artery hypertension. So you can now understand that it's the antibodies that are going to determine what kind of disease you're going to get. And it's not the disease classification as such. So whatever antibody you have, that is going to tell you what kind of disease that you're going to get in the setting of a scleroderma or any other rheumatological disease for that matter. So the more the antibody you have always, it's the uh, bad sign. It's not a very good prognosis. And if you know the cause of death, so what is the cause of death in patients with scleroderma? So usually it's the pulmonary artery hypertension. That's the usual cause of death in the setting of a limited variety. When you think about a diffuse variety, it's easily predictable. It's going to be the ILD that's going to be the cause of death followed by SRC. Remember two decades back, SRC is supposed to be the most common cause of death in uh, diffuse variety of scleroderma. But uh, with the advent of dialysis and with the advent of, uh, you know, like many uh, uh, newer, I mean, uh, nephrological advances. So now SRC has become a rarer cause of death because the treatment of choice for um, scleroderma renal crisis is basically um, AC inhibitors. So with the advent of the good drugs, SRC related deaths are very rare nowadays. Now still the most common cause of death is industrial lung disease only even for diffuse variety. So I can tell boldly that respiratory failure is going to be the usual cause of death as far as scleroderma is concerned. This is in stark contrast with other diseases we have been discussing, like uh, SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, where we know the cardiovascular death is the most common cause of death. But on the other hand, uh, as far as this uh, scleroderma is concerned, the respiratory, uh, you know, like uh, causes the most common cause of death. 
So fine. So these are some of the important points with regards to limited versus the diffuse cleoderma variety. And you have multiple different antibodies like anti-PMACL is there. Then anti-U3 RNP is there, that is fibrillarian antibodies. So we don't want to discuss about that. And again, that's an antibody for diffuse cleoderma. I'll ask you one more thing. Anti-PMACL is there. That is polymyositis scleroderma overlap antibody. That will produce a limited scleroderma or a diffuse scleroderma. Anti-PMACL. That's a trivia for you. Limited or a diffuse? No, basically, anti-PMACL antibody typically tends to produce limited variety of scleroderma. So that's what we're going to see. What are the antibody associations next? As the antibody assignments are uh, seen, first I'm going to tell what is the type of scleroderma that you'll see in a particular antibody and what will be the associated findings with that particular antibody. And again, this is a very important point. First, as far as the antibody is concerned, the number one antibody is the anti-centromere antibody. The type of scleroderma that they will be causing is limited type of scleroderma and the most important association is pulmonary artery hypertension. Remember, ACA is actually protective for SRC. This antibody has shown to be protective. They don't uh, actually allow the patient to develop SRC. They are protective for scleroderma renal crisis. And second antibody that we need to know is anti-SCL70 antibody. And again, it's an antibody of diffuse variety of scleroderma. It generally tends to have a high risk of development of ILD as well as to a small extent, we have a risk of development of SRC as well. Then we have anti-RNA polymerase 3 antibody. Anti-RNA polymerase 3 antibody is associated with diffuse variety of scleroderma. It has a risk of development of SRC alone, not ILD. And similarly, we have anti-PMSCL antibody. We know that that is polymyositis scleroderma overlap antibody, which is associated with a limited variety of scleroderma, but the most important association is myositis. And remember this antibody, even though it's associated with limited scleroderma, they can have a high risk of development of ILD. And we have something called anti-U3 RNP antibody. I think you will remember that we have studied in immunofluorescence of uh, ANA. That's otherwise called as anti-fibrillarian antibody, which has a association with uh, diffuse variety of scleroderma and uh, they are also going to have a higher risk of development of ILD, SRC as well as pulmonary artery hypertension. All these three things can be associated with anti-U3 RNP antibodies. Then we have another antibody called as, these two antibodies I have not have told you before but uh, important. One is called as anti-TH T0 antibody or anti-TH2 antibody. Uh, this antibody is once again uh, seen in limited variety of scleroderma and as a risk of development of ILD and pulmonary artery hypertension. And finally, one more antibody which you know already that is anti-U1 RNP antibody. And this antibody is associated with uh, limited scleroderma again. And uh, we know this is an antibody of a MCTD. MCTD. But what I'm talking about is in a MCTD, you will get mixed CD means you'll get many different types of CDDs. So in MCTD, if you get the type of scleroderma, that scleroderma type will be limited type of scleroderma. And this is usually related to development of pulmonary artery hypertension. So different antibodies will give different uh, scenarios in uh, clinical practice. But I still feel like even though a lot of antibodies, the most important antibodies will be these two, probably maybe to an extent, this antibody. So RNA polymerase 3. But when the other antibodies are optional, if you want to score a very good rank, then you might be needing to know about other antibodies. Otherwise, I don't think uh, you need to know about other antibodies as well in this setting. Clear. And one more important point that we need to know about uh, this kind of pulmonary involvement is that scleroderma patients, we didn't tell that. So scleroderma patients in the pulmonary involvement, you can write, they can have a higher risk of developing lung cancers. That's an independent risk. Scleroderma patients are having higher risk of developing lung cancers. So which means uh, the most common cancer, of course, you'll be asking that is adenocarcinoma. In fact, any CDD can be having an association with lung cancer and the most common cancer is going to be the adenocarcinoma only in that setting. That could be a probable question in exam. And uh, as I told you, uh, you know, like respiratory failure is the usual cause of death in scleroderma. Whether thrombotic risk is there or not. Thrombotic risk in scleroderma is increased, normal or decreased. What's your take? Increase normal or decreased thrombotic risk? Nobody wants to answer. Okay. Of course, it is increased. 
even though respiratory failure is the common cause of death a lot of scleroderma patients are known to have premature coronary artery disease so it is of course increased thrombotic is still increased it's not like it's decreased it's still increased but even though the usual cause of death is respiratory failure in the setting of scleroderma and at the same time one more important point we forgot to tell i think slowly one by one it's coming for me so one more point we didn't tell is maybe in the face we can tell or skin we can tell these patients can produce something called a secondary jogren syndrome secondary jogren that is because of fibrosis of the salivary uh, glands and salivary ducts in the uh, mouth buccal cavity and that can result in severe dry mouth in these patients because of severe dry mouth this can lead to development of halitosis bad smell possible in uh, scleroderma patients which can result in um, that is due to secondary jogren that these patients are going to have now having known about different antibodies causing different sets of problems in patients with uh, scleroderma now let us talk about the common cause of death because we have not discussed extensively about this cause of death so one is pulmonary artery hypertension then ild src all these these are very important cause of death so for i mean as far as the treatment is concerned we are we are going to treat for the skin also but let us first finish off the uh, important things that is the death causes first is the pulmonary artery hypertension of course this is a type 1 pulmonary artery hypertension and uh, people who have attended my pulmonary lecture in the pulmonary medicine chapter and app should be knowing what the treatment for type 1 pulmonary artery hypertension that is going to be vasodilators there are a variety of vasodilators that are available for example you have uh, calcium channel blockers like nifedipin and verapamil can be used then we can have phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors like sildenafil tadalafil then we have endothelin one receptor antagonist that is uh, your bosentan ambrisentan macitentan so you have a lot of drugs are there even though currently preferred drug is ambrisentan we don't prefer bosentan or macitentan they are non selective selective drugs like ambrisentan is what is preferred right now endothelin one receptor antagonist so you can use prostacycline analogs so these are prostaglandin i2 analogs as well as prostacycline analogs best example is treprostinil yes correct then you have uh, uh, beraprost also lot of pga2 analogs are available then we can also use uh, certain other drugs like riosigwat this is a soluble gonadotropic cyclase activator this is a gonadotropic cyclase activator basically causing vasodilation we know that that's a oral drug we have riosigwat so and one more drug that's been approved recently is something called serilaxin is there but uh, efficacy is not known but this is a relaxin recombinant relaxin recombinant relaxin relaxin means they are going to relax the blood vessel so that's also available for treatment with type 1 pul pulmonary artery hypertension you have a lot of variety of treatment options are there in patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension and that's the usual cause of death in the setting of a limited scleroderma patient we know that then ild how you are going to treat ild interstitial lung disease of course the most common histological type that are going to get this non specific interstitial pneumonia that's the most common histological type and again biopsy is needed to tell whether it steroids will be effective or not but nevertheless we use steroids here so what is the treatment treatment will be given with steroids initially then it should be uh, i mean we should do some steroid sparing regimen i'll tell you what are the problem with steroids after some time because ild is common in diffuse variety if you use high dose steroids in diffuse variety there is always a risk of developing src scleroderma renal crisis so that's why steroid use in uh, diffuse variety should be extremely limited and any scleroderma patient should be extremely limited that's why this is a quite controversial statement so if you ask me in my personal practice i don't really use steroids to treat this ild also i mean especially high dose steroids can increase the risk of src substantially so that's why in my personal practice i don't use even though books are giving low dose steroids can be given but what is the use of giving low dose steroids in ild it don't work anyway the best treatment will be cyclophosphamide along with mmf this is supposed to be one of the best treatment options and currently there are a lot of regimens which have been uh, discussing with uh, our routine treatment isn't it that uh, kind of perfenidone we talked about tgf beta inhibitor that also has been tried but cyclophosphamide and mmf or cyclophosphamide alone or mmf alone is going to be the best treatment so there is a second treatment option that is also available as i told you that is mmf plus perfenidone because it's a tgf beta inhibitor and that's tgf beta is fibrogenic 
So this is also something that is available right now. You can put cyclophosphamide or MMF. Or MMF. Cyclophosphamide or MMF or MMF plus perifinone. These are the treatment options that are available right now. And third thing is the scleroderma renal crisis, SRC. Very common in diffuse scleroderma. How they will present? Usually they will be presenting with malignant hypertension. It's not right malignant hypertension. Currently, because the term malignant hypertension has been removed, as we discussed in cardiology, so you have to write as hypertension crisis. They'll be coming with extremely high BP. They'll be having acute kidney injury. Uh, and uh, they'll be having skin thickening and other evidences of scleroderma. And uh, they can have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia as well, MAHA. So this is a characteristic presentation how your SRC generally tends to present. So treatment of choice, if they ask you, answer is, of course, enlapril. That is AC inhibitors. Remember, here you have to remember not ARBs. ARBs are not proven to be beneficial, but AC inhibitors are. In this patients, even if the creatinine is 4.5, 5.5, whatever may be the case, it's advised to start with AC inhibitors as a first line drug. And they are shown to be having excellent mortality and morbidity benefit. So you have to definitely start with one of these drugs. And typical presentation is this only. As I told you, they are going to present with hypertensive crisis, very high BP, acute kidney injury, and they can have a microangiopathy, hemolytic anemia. You know, whenever you get a malignant hypertension, there will be one typical reactive change that you get in the vessels. What is that change? Everyone knows that. That's typical onion skin lesion, onion skin appearance of the glomerular vessels. If you do a kidney biopsy, that's what you will see. I mean, that can happen in any malignant hypertension. So if this is there, this is what we refer to as something called a malignant hypertension. We studied in pathology. I have studied this in pathology, in malignant hypertension, you will get an appearance in the gross appearance in the kidneys, what we refer to as a flea bitten kidney. And uh, when you take a biopsy and you see under the microscope, you'll see this kind of onion skin hypertrophy, onion skin hypertrophy of the vessels. And uh, urine routine will not show any finding. If you take urine, it will be bland. I mean, currently I'm introducing new uh, terminologies that bland urine and all, but uh, you'll be understanding much better what you mean by bland urine in the setting of a uh, nephrology, especially when you are discussing about AK, that time it will make a lot of sense. What do you mean by bland urine? So anyways, nevertheless, the most important point here is the AC inhibitors that are going to be the treatment of choice, the setting of a uh, scleroderma renal crisis. So these are the different treatment options for the killer reasons in scleroderma. But what are the risk factors for developing uh, uh, pulmonary artery hypertension? Remember, to develop pulmonary artery hypertension, so the risk factors are limited variety itself can develop pulmonary artery hypertension and anti-centromere antibody itself is a risk factor for development of pulmonary artery hypertension. Presence of extensive telangiectasias, which I've shown you is a risk factor for development of pulmonary artery hypertension. Then uh, presence of Raynaud's phenomenon for more than 10 years. So long standing Raynaud's phenomenon is a risk factor for developing pulmonary artery hypertension. Apart from that, many other antibodies, are, but these are the four important risk factors. Mm -hmm. As far as ILD is concerned, the most important risk factor for ILD is diffuse variety of scleroderma, one important risk factor. Then presence of anti topoisomer is one antibody, the anti scl 70 is an important risk factor for developing ILD. And more importantly, you don't believe that GRD is a very, very important risk factor and a strong risk factor for development of, I mean, uh, ILD. Even in general population, GRD is considered to be one of the important risk factors for development of, uh, you know, like ILD even in general population, because we believe that chronic long-standing GRD can result in microaspiration causing long-standing chemical pneumonitis, triggering the development of fibrotic changes in the lungs. So even in general population, GRD is considered to be a risk factor for developing ILD. So as such in scleroderma patients. And finally for SRC, once again, diffuse variety is a risk factor. Then you have anti-RNA polymerase 3 antibodies, that's a risk factor. And more importantly, this tendon friction drops, I told you that always indicates a high risk, high severity disease or active disease. Presence of tendon friction drops is a risk factor for development of SRC. And uh, finally, usage of high dose steroids, as I told you, that's always a risk factor. So that's why in scleroderma never use high dose steroids. High dose steroids use is almost always a risk factor for developing SRC in any patient with scleroderma. So that's why even in ILD, uh, I mean, even though practice guidelines are telling to use low dose, but in general, it's better to avoid steroids as much as possible. Even if there is a need to use steroids, use a very low dose steroids. Low dose prednisone equivalent of less than 20 milligram per day. Don't use beyond that because that substantially increases the risk of development of scleroderma renal crisis. And these are the risk factors for getting different problems.
apart from that other issues you are going to treat uh, very only symptomatically arthritis nsaids may be a lot helpful very conservative management may be a lot helpful then if you have uh, what else is there grd means proton pump inhibitors you are going to use so it's all supportive so these are the three important things that you need to know with regards to the scleroderma treatment so if you have understood scleroderma then we can move on. i mean we didn't talk about the skin involvement isn't it how to treat the skin involvement that's major one so how will you treat the skin involvement in scleroderma usually we don't have much options to treat the skin involvement as such in scleroderma but there are some options that have been proven to be a little beneficial for example one op standard option is methotrexate and second is mmf and third is cyclophosphamide these are three options that are available but none of the options have been concretely proven but you have an extensive skin thickening that is actually affecting the quality of life in that setting any one of these three drugs may be but nevertheless we are not very sure about the efficacy of these drugs but they might work in certain patients they can reduce the skin thickening index by the drod not score by 20 to 30 percentage but uh, we don't have a substantial benefit to these drugs so you have to carefully weigh the risk benefit ratio and then you have to start the treatment so that is uh, one important point that you need and what are the differential diagnosis so when you have scleroderma you have some dds to consider in mind the first differential diagnosis is of course a localized form of scleroderma so there are two forms isn't it in localized form of scleroderma one is your uh, morphia and second is the linear scleroderma both is a differential diagnosis and you have to carefully exclude that thing and apart from that you have a, another one called eosinophilic fasciitis eosinophilic fasciitis typically these patients will have combination of three findings Uh, this also referred to as something called a shulman syndrome or a shulman disease shulman syndrome or a shulman disease this should not be confused with your uh, uh, another shulman that is called as uh, upsha shulman disease which will be seen in the setting of uh, your uh, ttp thrombotic thrombogenic purpura which is a congenital deficiency of adams 13 that's upsha shulman disease you should not confuse that with this here shulman disease means it's eosinophilic fasciitis so you will have pudy orange appearance in the local area remember pudy orange appearance is never a feature of scleroderma so any presence of pudy orange appearance should trigger you to think about some other disorder like eosinophilic fasciitis or probably other disorders which will be telling in some time like uh, diabetic scleroderma is there so second thing is these patients will have something called a positive gru sign whenever you i mean when you ask the patient to stretch the skin there will be a gru formation so that's a characteristic gru sign which i'll show you because along the fascia they will form the groove because there will be facial infiltration of the eosinophils and these patients will have eosinophilia eosinophilia the definite diagnosis can be made with the help of biopsy in biopsy you will be seeing this kind of deep i mean i mean uh, deep eosinophilic infiltration remember if you take superficial biopsy that's not advocated so here you have to take a deep biopsy and you have to prove that there is a eosinophilic infiltrate that there is a eosinophilic infiltrate in the muscle and the fascia so this is going to be very specific in the skin if you have eosinophilic infiltrate that's not specific in the muscle and fascia if you have eosinophilic infiltrate that becomes very specific and uh, probably this is thought to have a association with borrelia as a pathogen but uh, we don't know really how much it is associated and third one is something called as nsf that's called a nephrogenic systemic fibrosis which is scleroderma like condition that is induced by gadolinium contrast so if the patient is having egf for less than 30 plus you are giving a gadolinium contrast in these patients so there is a lot of possibility the patient might get something called a nephrogenic systemic fibrosis it's a condition only there will be a diffuse sclerosis throughout the body but more importantly the difference from scleroderma is the fact that there will be there will be sparing of the digits which will not happen in the setting of scleroderma and apart from that there will be something called a brawny induration of extremities that's a characteristic finding there is no available treatment here so it's something which has to be prevented for sure and four you have something called a scleroderma that's different from scleroderma this is called a scleroderma of bushki that's called a scleroderma of bushki you have different three different types of scleroderma one year scleroderma type 1 year scleroderma type 2 and year scleroderma type 3 as a type 1 is concerned it's usually due to infection i mean i use ifx for inter i mean uh, 
uh, infliximab as well as for infection. So here I'm meaning infection. So don't get confused. Two is due to monoclonal gamma pathies. Three is typically due to long-standing diabetes mellitus. Called as this is what we refer to as diabetic scleredema, or otherwise referred to as something called a scleredema of I mean, scleredema diabetic or you can call it in any way. So type three is due to long-standing diabetes mellitus. So usually uh, they will commonly ask this finding only. I mean, this thing only diabetic scleredema. How will how it look like and where it will be there? Usually it will be in the neck and the shoulder girdle. This is where the skin thickening will happen. And typically, again, they will have a catastrophic beauty orange kind of an appearance. So that's a catastrophic feature of a diabetic scleroedema. And apart from that, you have another disease called a scleromyxedema. That's also a differential diagnosis. Scleromyxedema. That's also a very important differential diagnosis. So usually that will be presenting with a small papular kind of an appearance. There will be waxy red papules and that kind of papular appearance is due to mucin and fibroblastic deposition in the local area. And uh, there is another sign called a sharp A sign. A sharp A sign means there will be a deep furrowing in that particular area. And at the same time, they will be having another sign called as a donut sign, which I'll show you. That's something called a umbilicated appearance at the proximal interphalangeal joint, which I'll show you. So then the another differential diagnosis a uh, graft process host disease which can also produce a similar kind of an appearance remember if somebody asks you what is the most common organ involved in graft versus host disease it is the skin clear in chronic GVC, in chronic graft versus host disease the most common organ involved is the skin and in acute graft versus host disease the most common organ involved is the intestine so these two things could be your exam questions as well skin was the intestine fine so let us see the images before going on to that. So what are these basically? So this is that characteristic groove sign that you are seeing in different facial planes. Uh, this is characteristic of an eastern flick fasciitis groove sign that you are seeing. This is an example of a diabetic scleroderma or otherwise called a scleroderma diabetic orum, where you can see this kind of pewdy orange appearance that is clearly visible on the back very commonly. And uh, this is basically a scleromyxedema where you can see this kind of lax skin and this is called a Sharpe sign. Like Sharpe fibers are there. So that's why it's called a Sharpe sign. And uh, again, it's a scleromyxedema. And you can see this kind of waxy papules, which you can look for. So this is again a sign of a scleromix edema. Uh, this is due to mucin and fibroblast deposition. And uh, at the same time, this is a groove sign that you're seeing. You can see in the PAP joints, there will be a groove kind of an appearance. So this is basically a groove sign. These are pathognomonic signs for scleromix edema. I think these things you would have already encountered in uh, your dermatology textbooks. So I don't want to uh, talk much about that right now clear then we'll be moving on to the next disorder that is jogren syndrome jogren syndrome so jogren syndrome uh, can be of two types remember anything Yes, I mean, Keshav is correctly asking, what is the role of nail fold caploscopy? Because I think he has seen the image of nail fold caploscopy. That's why he's asking, what is the role of nail fold caploscopy? I forgot to tell, sorry for that. So nail fold caploscopy is not that much uh, a very useful investigation in the routine clinical practice, but still, if you want to do it, it's a very good investigation. So this is a normal nail fold caploscopy. I mean, it's very easy to see nail fold caploscopy. You just, all you need is just an immersion oil and you need a fundoscope. That's all that you use to see the eyes. Because there are only two areas where you can see these arterioles and probably capillaries directly with your eyes. One is the eyes and second is the nail fold. Both these arterioles and capillaries can be seen with nail, I mean, your fundus, uh, funduscope. But even though you have separate devices that can look for nail fold capillaroscopy, but fundus itself is more than enough. Just put a uh, immersion oil and you just see with the fundoscope, that area. So this is a characteristic nail fold capillaroscopy where you can see nice and tight capillaries that are coming out. And this is an example of a scleroderma patient. 
where you can see you know like there are a lot of kind of ugly appearances there it's not smooth like what we saw there it's uh, tortuous dilated capillaries are there here and there these are tortuous and dilated capillaries then we have a dropout reduced number of capillaries that's what we call a capillary dropout uh, initially itself i told you this so that's typical of a scleroderma and apart from that there is one more disease an unrelated disease but but all that also is uh, one of the important examples of vascular disease that's called dermatomyositis dermatomyositis where you can still see this kind of uh, uh, picture so same kind of nail fold capillaroscopy picture can be seen in setting of dermatomyositis as well okay all right next uh, i think now you are okay isn't it keshav has got his answer so what is nail fold capillaroscopy same kind of picture can be seen in the setting of your uh, dermatomyositis as well then let us move on to the jogren syndrome in jog i mean again jogren syndrome is going to be uh, common in females compared to that of males usually very common in the females with mid 30s and 40s that's where you're going to get jogren syndrome we're talking about a primary jogren syndrome for that matter is not the secondary jogren So as far as Jogren syndrome is concerned, means it's called as Sika symptoms. Sika means uh, dry. That's what we mean by Sika. Or dry eyes. I mean the mucosal surface that become dry is what we refer to as Sika. As far as Sika symptoms are concerned, uh, it can be primary, which means idiopathic Sika. So this is typically called as something called a primary Jogren syndrome. And if it is secondary to underlying disorder, that's called a secondary Jogren syndrome. so this underlying disorder could be anything for example the most common underlying disorder that produce secondary jogren syndrome we know it is rheumatoid arthritis as i said i told you the leak can produce that systemic sclerosis can produce that sometime back only we saw mc mixed cardiac disorder can produce that and uh, you have a lot of vasculitis which can produce that hepatitis c virus can produce that. so i can write separately on the side so that i'll save some space so mctd can produce that and uh, vasculitis can produce that hepatitis c virus can produce that and very importantly you know like as far as i am concerned because i am teaching for entrance examination pbc is very important primary biliary cirrhosis remember in exam if patient is having a cholestatic jaundice having a sika syndrome is equal to pbc so that's a very important point as far as exams are concerned because most of the patients with primary biliary cirrhosis will have sika symptoms 70 to 80 percentage very high prevalence So that's why PBC is going to be of exam importance. Other things, only one point which is important is rheumatoid arthritis is the most common cause of uh, secondary Jogren syndrome. Apart from that, if at all the next thing that you need to know for exams is going to be the PBC. That's going to be the most important because that's how the questions are framed. That's going to produce uh, uh, secondary Jogren syndrome. And suppose how will you differentiate? Very simple. If you have whether other associated disorders there or not, here definitely no in primary. Yes, there will be some other osteoarthritis. For example, rheumatoid arthritis here, and is there any HLA association? HLA association, you have something called DR52. System sclerosis, I told you DR7. Similarly, sorry, Aplas syndrome, I told DR7. Similarly, your uh, Jogren syndrome will have association of with the DR52. Remember here, it depends because we know whatever the disease is, depending on what is the type of disease, you will get uh, that particular HLA association. For example, with rheumatoid arthritis, you will get a dr4 association so depends so it's not a fixed d i mean hla association so now having known about the difference between primary versus the secondary jogren syndrome now it's better to look for the clinical features of jogren syndrome you can split the clinical which of jogren syndrome into two one is called glandular feature and second we have something called extra glandular feature of jogren syndrome because jogren syndrome is a multi systemic disease it doesn't affect only the uh, exocrine Uh, you know like uh, secretory glands so typically jogren syndrome if you ask pathophysiology in a single point you know this pathophysiology is only one that is cd4 and every point every word is important cd4 infiltration of exocrine secretory glands secretory glands typically those that are involved in the mucosa very commonly so this is basically jogren syndrome i mean this is idiopathic we don't know why again you can tell the same nonsense like virus environment genetic everything will be the same but it's due to the uh, 
CD4 infiltration of the exocrine secretory glands. That is Jogren syndrome. So glandular versus extra glandular. So as far as the glandular phase are concerned, the most common feature is going to be the Sika. Sika features are going to be the most common. And as far as Sika features are concerned, you can get dry eyes. Number one, dry eyes is what we refer to something called as xerophthalmia. It's very common in the setting of uh, Jogren syndrome. And if they ask you the first uh, dryness, where you'll get, that is dry eyes, xerophthalmia. This is the first thing to happen in Jogren syndrome. So usually this patient will be having a sort of a gritty sensation, foreign body sensation. They can have a pain in the eyes because the eyes are extremely dry. And uh, slowly they can even lose the vision because of severe exposure keratitis and because of severe dryness and they will result in keratitis and they can have local infection, increased chance of local infections happen because you don't have that protective uh, products in the tears. So that is why they can go for low vision and they can go for increased risk of infections. And uh, as far as the Jogren syndrome is concerned, which layer is typically affected? You have a tear film, of course. If you take this entire tear film, it is going to have three layers. So one is going to be the middle aqueous layer. So I can put like this. So the middle layer is going to be the aqueous layer. We know that and that's the biggest layer. 90% of the tear film is actually controlled by the middle aqueous layer only. And uh, we have the outer oily layer. So outer I remember by mnemonic, outer oily or there's a lipid layer. You know, this is actually coming from the Maybomian glands. Maybomian glands. And you have an inner layer. Inner layer is made of mucin. Inner layer is there, this is made of mucin. And this is basically coming from the goblet cells. We know that. Goblet cells. And this aqueous layer basically is coming from the lacrimal glands. Which of the layer is typically affected in Jogren syndrome in the tear film? Everyone knows and everyone should know this. Which of the layers typically affected in Jogren syndrome? It's the aqueous layer. That's the one that is maximum effect because lacrimal glands are characteristically involved in Jogren syndrome with CD4 infiltration. And this also can well be involved. Maybomian layer also can be involved in the setting of Jogren syndrome. It's not only the aqueous. Aqueous is the commonest, but Maybomian gland layer also can be involved. Okay, so nevertheless, you are getting dry eyes. Apart from that, you are going to get dry mouth. You know, what is the term for dry mouth? We call it as xerostomia. And after dry eyes, you are going to get dry mouth only. So this patients will get... Uh, uh, sort of dysphagia. The dysphagia here not because of esophageal issue, it is because of uh, the poor processing of food because they will try to swallow food as such because there is no saliva they cannot secrete. I mean, they cannot uh, process properly and they can get odinophagia, painful swallowing, dysphagia and odinophagia and they feel uh, that their mouth is always dry and there will be difficulty swallowing and they will get dental caries because of loss of saliva over a period of time and the taste changes will be there. And they'll often uh, feel kind of a metallic taste sensation and they will not then they will feel the food is very bland even if it is very spicy or tasty so that's the problem with regards to the dry mouth and apart from that they can go for the dry vagina because vagina is also one important layer that you need to know and many patients can have a bilateral parotid and lacrimal gland enlargement i'll tell you the differential diagnosis later on parotid and lacrimal gland enlargement can be seen in many of these patients. So fine. And uh, we have discussed about that. So what about the extra glandular involvement? As far as the extra glandular involvement is concerned, uh, the most common feature will be constitutional symptoms. Of course, we know that majority of the uh, candidates to disorder we have been, we have been uh, discussing till now will have constitutional features only. And of course, the most common will be the same fatigue that we have been discussing for a long time. And they can have skin dryness. That's not a gland area. That's why you're calling it the extra glandular area. Skin dryness is what we refer to as something called a xerosis. And apart from that, they can have joint involvement, musculoskeletal involvement in... One second. They can have musculoskeletal involvement. That is the 
joint involvement which can result in development of arthralgia and they can result in development of arthritis also remember this arthritis is again non erosive form of arthritis unless and until they have a high titus of rheumatoid factor they will not result in erosive form of arthritis usually it will be a non erosive form of arthritis only you should have high titus of rf or acpa should be there to produce erosive form even though the patient is having rf unless and until if it's in high titus you cannot get erosions fine so then if they ask you most common systemic feature extra glandular systemic feature again it's arthralgia jogren syndrome patients i mean even though most common extra glandular manifestation is constitutional symptoms if they ask you most common systemic manifestation due to extra glandular feature answer will be arthralgia and arthritis that's going to be more common they can have pulmonary involvement also jogren is known to produce ild and the most common will be nsip especially in nsip there is a sub division of nsip a variant of nsip is there what is that variant if you tell i'll be very happy that is very characteristic of jogren what is that variant of nsip that you get yes that is lip that's called lymphoid interstitial pneumonia that's very characteristic of jogren fine apart from that you can get cns in i mean neurological involvement if they ask you most common neurological manifestation of jogren it's called as peripheral neuropathy what is the speciality of peripheral neuropathy anyone who has attended the class carefully will be able to tell this what is the speciality of this peripheral neuropathy i think i have told you already in neurological section so you should be able to tell it only one answer i got what about other people there are a lot of people who have been attending i guess yes the 70 plus are there so what is the answer only one one person has answered till now which means you are not studied typically it will be a small fiber neuropathy i have told you already in neurology so ncs will be normal no condition study cannot differentiate this kind of neuropathy you should need a no bio i mean uh, skin biopsy local biopsy is needed apart from that they can have gastrointestinal tract involvement where they can have esophageal dysmotility and uh, resultant dysphagia can be because of this also 30% of patients with jogren syndrome can have dysphagia and apart from that they can get hematological involvement in hematological involvement of course anemia is going to be the most common and in that uh, it will be usually due to anemia of chronic disease we know that and more importantly they can develop monoclonal gammopathy monoclonal gammopathy remember presence of monoclonal gammopathy substantially increase the risk of development of your uh, non hodgkin lymphoma if they ask you the most common cancer that is associated jogren syndrome it is non hodgkin lymphoma again presence of monoclonal gammopathy raised monoclonal immunoglobulins are very very important because they are associated with the high risk of development of nhl and if they ask you what kind of antibodies elevated in jogren syndrome it is igg followed by igm so usually the monoclonal antibody will be igg in the setting of jogren syndrome and when are you monoclonal gammopathy high risk of development of um, non hodgkin lymphoma subsequently and apart from that they can have lymphadenopathy they can have uh, raynaud's phenomenon possible and they can also have cryoglobulinemia we'll discuss about that later on i'll ask you that time when i discuss about cryoglobulinemia they can have autoimmune thyroiditis and best comes the last this is a multiple times asked question kidney involvement that is a distal rta distal renal tubular acidosis i don't know why but uh, this is not a very common finding in jogren but we have picked up case of jogren based on distal rta alone so very very common question exam i don't think how many times they have asked this they have asked like from 2005 onwards they have been asking last asked in 2018 again so jogren syndrome can cause distal rta jogren syndrome patient comes with hypokalemia it's un, i mean straight forward you can diagnose it's a distal renal tubular acidosis only so these many features are there so what are the important things here of course that arthralgia is important peripheral neuropathy which is small fiber type is very important of course this monoclonal gammopathy producing high risk of nhl is very important igg 
that's the most common that's important and distal rt is the final most important if at all if you distill down until one thing that is important extra glandular manifestation that's going to be distal renal tubular acidosis very 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 important that's all clear um okay fine so we talked about this increase risk of nhl so what type of nhl we didn't tell that isn't it can anyone tell what type of nhl these patients will have high risk what type of nhl i got an answer that's correct so we call that as maltoma because this is a mucosal problem so you get maltoma it's a mucosal problem right so you're going to get uh, this mucosal acid lymphoid issue maltoma which is otherwise referred to as a marginal zone b cell lymphoma so that's a common type of nhl usually the most common site for getting maltoma is going to be the stomach even though it can happen in the intestine so gastric maltomas are extremely common but even though it can it can happen in the setting of a uh, you know like in the intestine also it's possible but most common site is stomach apart from that there are some risk factors for development of nhl we know the first risk factor of course is going to be the monoclonal gamma pathy that uh, increase the risk by almost 15 to 20 times to develop uh, non hodgkin lymphoma and presence of long standing lymphadenopathy like for example like 10 years 5 years the patient is having continuous lymphadenopathy that increases the risk presence of splenomegaly is very rare in jogren but if there is splenomegaly there is high risk of developing uh, nhl and if the patient is having leukopenia it's not very common in jogren syndrome but still if it is there then it indicates a, a risk of development of uh, uh, nhl maltoma and suppose if you are doing a biopsy the one of the gold standard methods for diagnosing a jogren syndrome is doing a biopsy from the uh, minor salivary glands from the mouth i mean usually do from the lip i'll tell you how but in that biopsy that lip biopsy you are doing if the b cells are arranged in such a way that they are producing germinal centers if you see germinal centers in lip biopsy that increases the risk of developing non hodgkin lymphoma and parotid enlargement itself is known to cause high risk of subsequent non hodgkin lymphoma these are the higher risk factors for development of non hodgkin lymphoma of course the most highest risk factor is the presence of monoclonal gammopathy i mean this has been asked once in pg exam that's why i told you this otherwise i would not have told that's all so then how do you diagnose jogren so now having known about lot of glandular and extra glandular features investigation part so what are the investigation investigations first of all you need to prove the dry eyes i mean if you really want to know how to diagnose jogren it's like a triad three things has to be proven one is the dry eyes that you need to prove definitely in jogren one of the earlier findings in jogren second is serology third thing is biopsy okay these are three things biopsy will be taken from the lip lip means this area this inside that's a minor salivary gland biopsy that's where you take uh, biopsy in jogren syndrome patients these are the cornerstone according to the guidelines if you have two out of three it is equal to jogren but nevertheless don't follow the criteria uh, it's not really needed because there are there are some pitfalls of course so how we can prove the dry eyes number one there are many ways you can prove the dry eyes but uh, definitely it is not schirmer's test and traditional way to prove the dry eyes is by using something called a schirmer test uh you know what you do in schirmer test in schirmer test you use something called a whatman number 41 filter paper and i think uh, this is where it is use a whatman uh, 41 number filter paper and uh, you just insert that filter paper into the eyes and just keep it like that for uh, around uh, you know like 5 uh, 5 minutes there so you're going to keep there for around 5 minutes just like that in 5 minutes you can see how much the filter paper has uh, soaked in the tears so then based on that i can tell whether the patient is having dry eyes or not this is a traditional method but it's not advocated currently not used and it's not a standard at all suppose if it is less than 5 mm in 5 minutes so that is suggestive of dry eyes number 1 second if it is more than 15 mm it is considered to be normal uh, 
if it is somewhere around 5 to 15 mm it is considered to be a gray zone so which means it cannot tell anything so if it is less than 5 mm in 5 minutes so that is supposed to be a jogger syndrome then but what you follow i mean if you don't want to use the shield mat test then what test you want to use there are multiple other tests other currently we use something called ocular staining score that's called oss ocular staining score score so as far as the ocular staining score is concerned uh, there are two types of ocular staining one is called the rose bengal stain that we use and second one you can use fluorescent stain uh, more than fluorescent i can write lysamine green lysamine green lysamine green currently rose bengal test is outdated rose and they have a separate scoring system rose bengal is currently outdated because rose bengal cause a lot of irritation and it uh, is not very good so in scoring and all it's produce a lot of technical difficulties also we don't use rose bengal currently advocated method is the lysamine green method so one problem problem with lysamine green is the fact that it cannot uh, stain the conjunctiva it can stain only the cornea but rose bengal can stain both the uh, cornea as well as the conjunctiva so that's one uh, big advantage of lysamine green stain so using lysamine green there is a separate scoring system called sika score the sika score the score is more than or equal to 4 then it's supposed to be no i mean normal the score is less than or equal to 4 that is suggestive of something called a jogren syndrome the sika score Less than or equal to four. That is suggestive of jogger. If it's more than or equal to four, then it's supposed to be uh, normal in the setting. So, lysamine green is less irritant and uh, much better compared to the rose bengal. And currently, we prefer the lysamine green only. If you go back and see, this is uh, how you do. So, this is an example of a rose bengal stain that we use. Put here. So, this is an example of a rose bengal stain. And whatever areas that are you know like uh, stained with pink color that you see here, these are basically the de-whitelist areas. Similarly, you can see the lysamine green stain here. The one disadvantage of lysamine green stain is lysamine green stain can stain only the conjunctiva; they cannot stain the cornea. To stain the cornea, you separately need to use something called a fluorescent stain. Fluorescent stain has to be used separately to stain the cornea. But lysamine green is Much better, lesser irritant, and more valid. So, lysamine green can stain only the conjunctiva; it cannot stain the cornea. For staining the cornea, you separately need fluorescent stain, but it is much better, less irritant, easy to analyze. So, these dots that you see here, I think you can see a lot of dot-like structures here. So, these dots actually are counted. Uh, I mean, not everything. So, certain areas will be counted and they will be extrapolated, and you can based on that you can give a Sika score. so this is lysamine green and there is another test called tbut that's called a tear film breakup time it is not a very good test uh, but nevertheless you can use something called a tbut here the stain that you use is fluorescent stain to stain the cornea so there will be some i mean whenever the patient uh, uh, closes the eyes after fluorescent and they open the eyes and see you should not allow them to close the eyes and you should be closely watching the tear film so at one point of time the tear film will break up usual normal tbut is more than 10 seconds it takes at least more than 10 seconds for the tear film to break up if it is less than 10 seconds it is considered to be abnormal so that is considered as abnormal tbut and usually that tell that tells you a tear film instability rather than it's a dry eyes usually if the tbut is less than 10 seconds it tells you that the patient is having a unstable tear film so unstable tear film does not mean that the patient is having a jogger syndrome it can be due to either a meibomian gland problem or it can be due to an aqueous gland problem doesn't matter so you have another thing called tbut if less than 10 seconds may suggest the tear film is unstable but it is again not a very important test in jogren syndrome currently advocated is ocular staining score using lysamine green so that's the currently advocated one so forget the sika score and all not that much important but uh, ocular staining score using lysamine green is the current standard of Uh, checking for the dry eyes, not shimmer or not your uh, tear film breakup time. As far as the serology is concerned, many antibodies can be positive in Jogren syndrome. One of the most important antibodies is ANA, very common antibody that can be positive. And if you subdivide that, anti SSA and uh, SSB will be positive. These are Jogren syndrome antibodies. These are the things that are given in the guidelines. But you also have should understand that uh, many patients with Jogren syndrome will also be RF positive. 
that's going to give a considerable confusion in clinical practice because Jogren syndrome can also lead to arthritis. Uh, they can also produce dry eyes and they will be rheumatoid factor positive. Rheumatoid arthritis patients will also have arthritis, can also have Sika syndrome, dry eyes. These patients also will have rheumatoid factor positive. How you are going to differentiate them? <laughs> They'll give a very big confusion. Usually, uh, remember whenever the patients uh, who are having rheumatoid, I mean, whenever the patient has rheumatoid arthritis, these arthritis generally tend to be erosive in nature because the RF will be usually in high titers. Whenever the patient is having low titers of RF, and if this arthritis is non-erosive form, and my Sika is going to be the prominent finding, then I will be diagnosing uh, Jogren syndrome in that perspective. At the same time, when I'm going to do a lip biopsy, rheumatoid arthritis will not show the typical CD4 infiltration, but Jogren syndrome is going to show that. That's why lip biopsy is also one of the standard of care. And rheumatoid arthritis, we know, rheumatoid arthritis will be ANA positive or ANA negative, rheumatoid arthritis. ANA positive or ANA negative, rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, of course, going to be ANA negative. They're not going to be ANA positive. So rheumatoid arthritis uh, will not have this anti rho anti-la antibodies and all. They will not have this anti-SSA, anti-SSB. So of course, uh, that is also an important difference from rheumatoid arthritis. So it will give a very big confusion. Be very careful. So in especially in real life. So when you take a lip biopsy, what you will see in lip biopsy, typically you will be encountering this uh, kind of, you know, like, Salivary gland acinae will be there, you know, this is basically an acinae. So this is the duct and surrounding cells. So this entire unit is what we refer to as acinar cells or acinae. What happens in the setting of Jogren syndrome is there will be infiltration by lymphocytes of this duct and the acinar group. And the duct, acinae, everything will be lost and you'll be seeing only a focus of inflammation there. So these are nothing but CD4 lymphocytes that are infiltrating the acne and the duct. Because we know that's the arrangement of a salivary gland. So they will have a surrounding cells that will pour their secretion into the duct that will be carried out as a saliva through the salivary ducts. There will be CD4 infiltration in that area. So for that, you need to know something called a focus. So suppose if there are more than 50 lymphocytes uh, in this one particular area, this is considered to be one focus. More than 50 lymphocytes in this particular one area will be called as one focus. And uh, the patient is supposed to have Jogren syndrome if there is more than or equal to one focus for every four millimeter square area in the biopsy that you are examining. Based on that, you have a separate focus score itself. This is called a focus score. The final focus score tells that there is at least one focus per every four millimeter square area in the lip biopsy that you are taking. So that is suggestive of a Jogren syndrome for sure. I mean, not, but still you should satisfy this criteria. Dry eyes which should be proved by ocular staining score. Then uh, you should prove by serology, you should prove by lip biopsy. So if, out of three, if you have two at least, then you can tell the patient is having Jogren syndrome. Remember, that's why in the guidelines, you don't have rheumatoid factor positivity because that will give a considerable confusion. That's why they have used only this ANA and anti-SSA and SSB. If they ask you the most common antibody seen in Jogren syndrome, it is ANA, of course, primary Jogren. Remember, if rheumatoid arthritis is causing dry eyes, you will not have this. ANA positivity. That's why whenever the patient is having uh, low titers of RF or the patient is not having RF, but the patient is having arthritis, I told you before jumping into the conclusion of seronegative rheumatoid arthritis, always rule out other causes. Then move on to the diagnosis of seronegative arthritis. Then how can you prove the dry mouth? I mean, even though that's not given in the guidelines, can you prove the dry mouth? Dry mouth can be proven. Uh, by using something called a silometry, but even though it's a very cumbersome and a complicated process, we generally don't want to prove this uh, dry mouth basically. Silometry means they are going to find out the salivary flow rate. So I'm going to write as SFR, that is salivary flow rate that are going to find out here. So we are going to see what is normal and what is suggestive of dry mouth and what are the ways to do a silometry. There is something called a stimulated salivary flow rate and you have an unstimulated salivary flow rate. So normally the unstimulated salivary flow rate will be approximately 0.3 to 0.5 ml per minute and a stimulated salivary flow rate will be approximately 1 to 2 ml per minute. 
but in setting of jogan syndrome that is in the setting of uh, xerostomia that is dry mouth the unstimulated salivary flow rate will be less than 0.1 ml per minute and the stimulated salivary flow rate will be less than 0.5 ml per minute so which means in patients with jogan syndrome they cannot produce beyond this so the maximum salivary flow rate in patients with jogan syndrome will be 0.5 ml per minute only beyond that they cannot produce that's one of the important questions in exams that have been asked one of the aims exams in 2018 17 i think they have asked the maximum salivary flow rate that can be produced by jogan syndrome patients is uh, less than 0.5 ml per minute only or i can write less than 1.5 ml in 15 minutes this is also correct so that's the highest amount of saliva that these patients can produce so to produce stimulated salivary flow rate there are two techniques are there one is called the classic gum test is there so gum means you have a chewing gum and chewing gum is going to stimulate your saliva and you can keep spitting so that's a gum test second one you have something called a gauze test gauze test which means you just uh, weigh the gauze you just weigh the gauze once you weigh the gauze before you just keep the gauze in the corner of the mouth and after some a few minutes of time you take the gauze and weigh it back again so the difference in weight will tell you how much saliva is secreted so based on that you can find out the stimulated salivary flow rate as well so this is how you measure for the salivary i mean salivary flow rate and uh, mri mri is not important uh, but one important finding with mri of the parotid glands has been shown to be important in jogan syndrome but that can be asked because it's named you get something called a salt and pepper appearance of the salivary gland that's because of inflammation and destruction and at the same time there is a that's also referred to as something called a honeycomb appearance or honeycomb of the salivary gland we are talking about the parotid glands parotid salivary glands this find findings in mri of the parotid gland fine so let us see the images so this is the t but we discussed this is the rose bengal lysamine green we discussed and uh, this is a classic example of a salivary gland that you see in ultrasound and uh, this is an ultrasound salivary gland and this is a salivary gland that you see in the mr you can see this kind of salt and pepper appearance and honeycombing kind of an appearance so that's very characteristic then you have a, a lip biopsy so as far as the lip biopsy is concerned you can see this is an asini this is a normal asini you can see this is the duct and surrounded by this asinar cells this is normal but as far as jogren syndrome is concerned you can see you know like i don't know where is the you know like uh, duct in the first place this is a, a duct as in a component that is completely infiltrated with lymphocytes if it is going to have more than 50 lymphocytes in that particular area i'll be calling it as one focus in that setting so that's one focus and if you calculate the number of focus if it's more than one at least one or more per 4 mm square area then i'll be calling it as a jogren syndrome in that setting so then what are the differential diagnosis uh, for example for salivary gland swelling so that's very important again if i ask you the differential diagnosis for salivary gland swelling you have two types of differential diagnosis asymmetric parotid gland swelling and symmetric parotid salivary gland swelling asymmetric the most important example is mumps we know that it's infective and it's painful that's very important difference because jogren syndrome enlargement will not be painful it will be painless mumps will definitely be painful hiv can produce this kind of asymmetric swelling for example they produce a disease called dils what do you mean by dils what is the expansion of dils that's called a diffuse uh, infiltrative lymphocytic syndrome that's what we refer to as dils and how can you differentiate this from uh, parot i mean jogren syndrome most important is biopsy here you'll have cd8 infiltration not cd4 because cd4 are not there in hiv you can understand like that you'll have cd8 infiltration rather than a cd4 infiltration that's dils a diffuse infiltrative lymphocytic syndrome and uh, you can have some granulomatous diseases granulomatous problems like tuberculosis is a granulomatous problem uh, sarcoidosis is a granulomatous problem they can produce this kind of uh, as asymmetric parotid gland enlargement then you have a disorder called igg4 related disease there is time i will tell you about that ig4 related disease so all these things can produce asymmetric parotid gland swelling what are the examples of symmetric parotid gland swelling the classic example is jogren syndrome symmetric and bilateral it can happen in the setting of a 
cirrhosis of the liver. You would have studied one of the important uh, features of liver cell failure. Cirrhosis is uh, parotid gland swelling. You would have studied recently. Even chronic alcoholism, even without cirrhosis, can result in development of this kind of bilateral symmetric swelling. And some endocrine causes are there. Like for example, diabetes mellitus, acromegaly, and some psychiatric problems like anorexia nervosa, then bulimia nervosa, then chronic pantreatitis. There are many are there in the list, but of course the most important as far as exams are concerned is Chogren syndrome and cirrhosis. Maybe to small extent you can remember chronic alcoholism and diabetes mellitus, but apart from that I don't think others are important. And even amyloidosis can produce parotid gland enlargement. Clear? So all these things can produce uh, salivary gland involvement. I mean, uh, parotid gland enlargement. Asymmetric causes are on the left, symmetric causes are on the right. So as far as the DDs for primary jogger, the closed DDs. Closed DDs for primary jogger is concerned with parotid gland enlargement. The first DD is of course going to be HIV. That is producing DILs. You know, by biopsy, they're going to have CD8 infiltration on CD4. That's going to the biggest difference and the patient will be HIV positive. And apart from that, there is something called the age-related Sika syndrome. Age itself will cause uh, this kind of, uh, you know, like Sika, dry eyes, dry mouth kind of a picture. So usually it will be more than 65 years. Patient will not have any antibodies with them and biopsy will be absolutely normal. Only there can be atrophy of the SNA rather than CD4 infiltration. There'll be no inflammation going on. That's age-related Sika. But more importantly, uh, two, are, two are important for exam. One is sarcoidosis. As far as sarcoidosis is concerned, biopsy will not show this kind of CD4 infiltrate. In fact, in fact they will show this kind of non cascading granulomas. If sarcoidosis is the cause. Apart from that, the most important is the IgG4-related disease. IG4 related disease. IG4 related disease coming up uh, in a very big way in the last one or two decades because previously the disease which are thought uh, to be, you know, like separate disorders like retroperitoneal fibrosis. Some few causes of retroperitoneal fibrosis now thought to be due to IG4 related disease. And there is something called previously there was a disease called autoimmune pancreatitis. Currently, autoimmune pancreatitis is thought to be one of the manifestations of IG4 related disease. Then we thought uh, something called Riddle's thyroiditis previously, but currently Riddle's thyroiditis is uh, thought to be due to IG. I mean, not all the cause of all the patients with Riddle's thyroiditis, few patients with Riddle's thyroiditis have been thought to be due to IG4 related disease, which means, and lymphocytic hypophysitis, one more disease there. So some uh, people with lymphocytic hypophysitis are thought to be due to IG4 related disease. Mediastinal fibrosis is there. Not all mediastinal fibrosis patients, few patients with mediastinal fibrosis are thought to be uh, due to IG4 related disease. So which means this IG4 related disease is a separate disease now, which can cause multi-systemic fibrosis. Multi-systemic or I can write multifocal fibrosis, multi-organ fibrosis. It can have fibrosis only in particular area also. For example, only in mouth they can have, only in thyroid they can have. So, but generally multifocal, they can produce fibrosis in any other any area in the body. The only strong way to diagnose IG4 related disease is biopsy, of course. There are three classical findings of uh, IG4 related disease in biopsy that you need to know, which can be asked in exams. One is, of course, going to be the IgG4 secreting lymphoplasmacytic infiltrates. So these cell, these areas will be infiltrated with this immune infiltrate, they are lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, there will be lymphoid cells as well as plasma cells and there will be IgG4 secreting. If you stain them for IgG4, they will be positive. That's IgG4 secreting lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate and they will have something called a storiform fibrosis. Number two and third, they will have something called an obliterative phlebitis. Obliterative phlebitis. And uh, serum IgG4 may be elevated, but this is not very sensitive. Only in 60% uh, of the patients, serum IgG4 may be elevated, but gold standard is of course going to be the biopsy. That's going to be the most important. So that's how we're going to diagnose. If you see that finding, that's typical IgG4 related disease. And that's a separate disease now, which can produce. That's a separate disease now, which can produce uh, 
multifocal fibrosis in different different areas three things one is igg4 secreting lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate storiform fibrosis and obliterative phlebitis as far as the treatment of jogren syndrome is concerned treatment is not very difficult treatment is quite simple and it's only supportive we don't really have much treatment for dry eyes we have some options are there like artificial tear drops and you can have uh, pilocarpin pilocarpin is outdated it causes a lot of problems like meiosis and all so we don't give pilocarpin right now you can use cyclosporine eye drops cyclosporine eye drops are available which can to an extent treat the dry eyes and you have different types of specialized lens for example there is something called boston scleral lens are there which is extremely costly one pair of lens costs around uh, 30 40000 rupees it's imported i mean if the patient is very rich you can prescribe them boston scleral lens which protects i mean it's like a lens for the full eye so which can typically protect the eyes from going for dryness then you have for dry mouth so dry mouth typically one drug is preferred that's called sevimelin sevimelin which is again a cholinergic drug you know pilocarpin is also cholinergic drug sevimelin is also cholinergic drug that is actually approved for use in dry mouth sevimelin so i don't think apart from that uh, there is no much treatment option there is an ild then you can go for immunosuppression if it's nsip especially not non fibrotic type then probably you can try immunosuppression in that setting uh, but apart from that i don't think there is going to be any much uh, use of immunosuppression in the patients with jogren syndrome there is no standard proven therapy that can slow down the progression or alter the disease uh, status in patients with jogren syndrome i think we have seen a considerable number of information in ctds now ctd is over so tomorrow we'll be discussing on vasculitis till that stay tuned i'll come tomorrow bye bye same thing i'll try to start by 10 to 10:30 depending on the connection we'll see our best we'll try our best i'll inform you in the group when i'm going to start good night bye bye see you next i'm planning to start with nephrology so after that after nephrology i'm planning with planning to start with hepatology so i'll tell you what are the dates and if once nephrology is over i'll start with hepatology liver